A very good morning to you all. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome two brilliant minds in the person of uh, Akino Okech and Pearl Sitoli. Pearl will be the respondent and uh, Akino will be our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, I haven't got long bios for them, so I wouldn't be doing justice to them. But uh, suffice it to say that I've run the program, I've seen that Aquino, Arino, sorry, Arino is a reader in political sociology at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. And uh, she will be free to say a little bit more about herself if she wishes to do so. And our respondent this morning to the keynote will be Pearl Stoley, social anthropologist and vice principal academic research at the University of Free Strait, the Kwangua campus in South Africa. I'm not sure whether I got the pronunciation right. So without much ado, let me call upon uh, a keynote to give her. So thank you very much. Uh, as um, the chair of the, the moderator of the panel has said, my name is Awino Okech. I am uh, what we call a reader uh, in other university systems that would be known as an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies. Uh, saw us as part of its uh, long history of rethinking its colonial roots. We no longer spell our name in full, but uh, we are not winning that campaign clearly. Uh, because we are not, we don't want to engage in the process of trying to remove the O, but as part of our own political acknowledgement, we now refer to ourselves just as SOAS University of London. We somehow believe that the SOAS brand is so strong, we don't need to explain what SOAS is. We are not winning that battle clearly, but we shall see. So uh, it gives me really great pleasure to be invited to give the second keynote as part of Cordestria's 50th anniversary reflection series. 28 years of gender institutes, 428 laureates, as uh, Godwin said yesterday, does indeed offer an important moment to reflect. It was quite useful for me to listen to Pinky's reflections yesterday on how the gender program emerged at Cordestria beyond the important intervention that I knew as a postgraduate student in form of the publication and the debates that arose that led to the publication on engendering social sciences. I, I recognize, and as Godwin foregrounded yesterday, that indeed this is an intergenerational move, given that Professor uh, Fatuso, a well-established, uh, well-known academic, uh, somebody many of us have studied and read, for those of us who've done gender uh, studies across the African continent and globally, gave the first keynote. And I'm here to sort of bookend the second keynote as somebody who comes from a different generation. Uh, I'm no longer in the youthful category. Uh, I'm certain if I was a man in the African system, I would still be claiming youthhood. Uh, but by, of, by official interpretations of youthhood, I'm no longer sitting there. But that might not necessarily be important for this conversation because I will speak a little bit to my engagement with gender institutes and you shall see that in some of those uh, uh, times, I was still in the category of youth uh, and, and that therefore mattered to how it is that I reflect on the, the gender institutes and where Codestra might potentially go. I'm an alumnus of, uh, and I say this for Justin's benefit, the only university north of the Limpopo and south of the Sahara, that's the University of Nairobi. <laughs> I am a child of teachers, so by virtue of the home environment, I was raised to take seriously the meaning of knowledge transfer as a way of both inhabiting the world and as a strategy for meaning and change making. I'm educated fully on the African continent, and that matters to the reflections I offer here today, because I speak as someone who understands and has, ex has experienced the unique challenges and opportunities of African universities, whose trajectories, as we all know, are shaped by the national and global political economy, which I will not necessarily rehearse in this talk. My engagement with Kodesha Gender Institute has occurred through three different moments and across different thematic areas. In 2013, I served as a resource person for the Gender Institute that focused on African sexualities, theories, politics, and action, that was co-directed by professors uh, Sylvia Tamale and Jane Bennett. In 2018, I served as a resource person again for the Gender Institute that focused on feminist scholarship, universities, and social transformation in Africa, that was directed by Professor Philomena Okeke Hejirika. Uh, 
And in 2021, in the height of COVID-19, uh, I had the distinct pleasure of directing the Gender Institute on Women and Girls and Shrinking Civic Space. In these roles as a resource person and as a director, whose role is quite different because you have the opportunity to set the tone of the Institute and ensure intellectual coherence, I therefore offer two main reflection points. The first is to talk about methodology and methods, and by methodology, I'm referring here to the Institute as a methodology that frames how Cordesia intervenes in debates around gender and gender studies much more broadly across the African continent and its diasporas. The methods being training and research as the anchors around which the Institute is uh, galvanized. And the second part of my talk will be looking at the intellectual imperatives for feminisms and here thinking about continental, the transnational and transdisciplinary. So on to the first part, which is around methodology, the institute and methods, teaching, training, and research. As an intensive model, the institute is designed to think about knowledge transfer that is anchored on the idea that over two weeks of a process that centers research papers, because laureates are required to send research papers in advance, a robust engagement with scholarship over the two weeks, and a process of peer review and discussion the logic is that through those institutes, you begin to contribute to a process of introducing, reintroducing, and strengthening feminist scholarship. Accompanying these two weeks is the idea that a post-institute publication enables a basis of engage engagement with what has been learned in the institute. So there's a, a whole process here of knowledge transfer that is assumed to be happening. And that through that publication process, what we hope to see is that we have extended the scholarship of those who are part of the institute. You don't just attend the institute for the institute's sake, but the institute then becomes an incubator for you to engage with your peers, engage with scholarship that you might not necessarily have had access to, and we see that translated in the sort of evolution of the research papers that you came into the institute with. This, therefore, is also a conversation about cohort building. It's about extended knowledge production and critical thought. In this regard, I think it is important 28 years later to examine whether the body of work that has been developed across the institutes has expanded the discursive terrain on various themes. It is here that the question of building, sustaining, and nurturing feminist epistemic communities lies, because it also requires that we examine the demands we place on those who come to the institutes while holding seriously the imperative of the teaching space, because the institute is indeed a teaching and learning space, as one that must be open, diverse, and filled with ephemerality. As a teacher, one of the things that I always say, that when I teach in the classroom, I recognize that there are people who will understand the concepts, theories, and ideas, and run with them. There are those who some of those ideas might not be useful for them, and that's, it's not my job as a teacher to feel some kind of way that the material did not land or stick with them. That is the process of teaching. And there are those for whom those ideas will be grasped in a particular moment, they will serve and feed their life in a particular moment, but they might move on to other journeys. And this is what I mean by the ephemerality of the teaching space. The teaching space is also one in which we must recognize that what we are here to do is not necessarily cast a strong ideological position, but is to use those ideological positions as a space for contestation and debate. It's not to jettison the ideological position, but as a teacher, the kinds of positions I would take if I was speaking in a conference and those I would take when speaking in a, in a, in a, in a teaching space, the teaching space demands of me to be able to be uh, much more flexible with the idea that anything I hear back from the room offers an opportunity for a teaching moment. It offers an opportunity for me to expand the ways in which the person who is questioning or raising particular issues that I might personally take a front with actually offer me the chance to engage with them both from a theoretical, conceptual based, uh, st standpoint in order to expand their modes of thinking. Now, I believe that there are multiple ways of tracking this sort of epistemic community that uh, Codestria has invested in over the last 20 years. And these include some of the very popular metrics that most of us use in institutions that do research or uh, teaching institutions, such as citations, thinking about cross citations, thinking about uh, how over successive and adjacent institutes, and not just the agenda institutes, governance institutes, or any other institutes, how we see this sort of knowledge uh, uh, pollination, cross-knowledge pollination happening, thinking through books which Godwin told us and the journals are open access, the downloads 
uh, for, for those uh, particular uh, books that are concerned and focused on questions of gender, and also a tracing study with the laureates to really determine what is it that your experience of the Gender Institute has stayed with you? How has that com contributed for those who are actually seated in African academies to the things that you teach in your classrooms, to the ways in which your research trajectories might have shifted as a result of that particular moment that you encountered the Gender Institute? And if it didn't, it also tells a story that Codestria can use in different ways to think through its methodology within the institute, but also the ways in which it invites people to apply and, um, and, uh, and, and engage with the Gender Institute. The second issue on methods that the institutes have raised for me concerns the genealogies, intellectual genealogies, that are obviously sustained by colonial legacies of our continent. Here, I'm referring to those old sort of descriptors, Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone, Arabophone, ETC. In 2013, during my first uh, uh, sort of uh, engagement with the Gender Institute, one of the things that struck me as somebody who had just finished their PhD, and therefore you've spent a lot of time reading, right? And that I was sitting in a room with people who were working around sexualities, but we were all reading very different things. Like the, the scholars who came from the so-called Anglophone world were familiar with a particular body of work, while our comrades were sitting in, uh, who came from French-speaking Africa and Lucifer speaking Africa were reading very, very different material. That, that for me is, today seems obvious, but was particularly fascinating at that particular moment. Because it says that we all of us are speaking and writing for very different intellectual languages on the one hand, but are also coming across ideas that are, might be produced in very, very different ways across those geopolitical terrains. Now, of course, I must intervene here and say that Codesia, in its commitment to work across languages, has continued to engage with the idea of translation as part of the process of making accessible scholarship that sits across different languages. But that work of translation is so vast that there's no way an, insti uh, uh, an institution such as Codesia can take on the challenge of doing translation work of material that has been produced over many decades and not necessarily by the institution. The other thing that struck me around the idea of intellectual genealogies over these three institutes that I've referred to was that a lot of the scholars that we were engaging with, the academics who were seated in the room, the researchers who were seated in the room, were stuck in old literature. And this is not to argue that old does not mean useful. But our, our work as academics and researchers is, to, is always to be able to trace where the debates have gone. Now, even if you might not necessarily be attached to the contemporary form of those debates, it is important for us to see that a conversation that began in the 1950s or 60s in this way, where is it now? How has it evolved? Because context change, time indeed, does matter in different forms. But beyond the idea of age of the literature, it was also that a lot of this material was European and particular forms of voices were seeping through a lot in the research papers, but also in the engagements of the laureates. Herein, I believe, lies the question of the purpose of scholarship, how it travels in the world, and the knowledge economies that frame this broad idea of access that many of us spoke about yesterday. From the basic idea of language, what language are you writing in? Uh, a former laureate spoke yesterday about the fact that Engl uh, material, the dominance of the English language means that material that is written in English is seen to, be to travel faster, travel wider. But I would also argue that even if you wrote in English and if you're seated in an academic institution, the very idea of publishing in particular journals because they have high impact factors and because, and often they're stuck behind paywalls, introduces another level of access that we must, of course, continue to engage with. Now, of course, Codestia's intervention in that has been through the idea of open access. They say knowledge must be made accessible and available. But that does not necessarily apply for other academics who are seated in institutions on the African continent who are seeking to see themselves as competing in the global higher education market and are therefore introducing the very same thing somebody like me sitting in London is faced with. When I publish an article, my university is interested in knowing whether that is a respected journal in your field. Now, respect, of course, we, need, we, we know comes with its own connotations that are deeply steeped 
in the long histories of these academic journals that are often based in the global north, that are often attached to particular institu institutions that do not necessarily, often they're not, uh, uh, give credence or, or sort of foreground the voices of scholars from this uh, place we call the global south. And more importantly, that the citation metrics that I was speaking about earlier, and there's a, there's a study that was done by Peace Medi and Alice Kang that looked at a number of journals, a longitudinal study over a number of periods, that talked about the citation of women in those journals that they were looking at. And the fact that women scholars, now remember they're just talking about women scholars, they're not talking about feminist scholarship, that the citations of women scholars were much lower in the field and within these uh, uh, particular journals. There's also the question of intellectual registers. I believe Mushai was referencing this yesterday. The fact that how is it that our work communicates beyond our immediate communities? Are you writing for your colleagues or are you writing for your communities that you're seeking to ensure that your work has an impact on them? And if you're writing not just for the academic community, but also to have quote unquote world impact, what are the intellectual registers that are useful to that process? And again, I'm not subscribing here to the idea that we have to write in specific ways in order for some other people to be able to hear it. But it's around the fact that if we take knowledge transfer seriously, if we take the idea of, uh, of, uh, of literacy seriously, then literacy means that we produce material in forms that are understood, that can be engaged with by different communities and different audiences in ways that make meaning for them. It's not about dumbing down. It's about making meaning for the audience that you are speaking to. The third and final issue and methods concerns the question of gender and feminism. And here, allow me to begin with two short vignettes. Uh, they're not good ones, but they were resolved in a good way. But they matter for the conversation I'm about to have. So in the 2021 Institute that I said I was a director of, and remember the Institute's run over two weeks, in week two, so you're assuming you've done enough groundwork in week one. Eh? In week two, in an in a, in a, in a institute that was focusing on the theme of women, girls, and violence and shrinking civic space, in which most of the laureates' papers focus broadly around questions of violence, a participant, when responding to questions about someone else's research paper on violence against women in universities, when his own research was also focused on violence against women, but in a slightly different context, argued that the idea of sexual harassment in universities, that the idea of violence against women in universities needs to be more nuanced. Because after all, surely, as a male academic, if somebody came and offered you sex, are you supposed to say no? And that really, the researcher must also interrogate the role of those women in actually creating these forms of violence. I want to repeat, this was in week two, right? We had assumed, I had assumed that we had done enough grounding of thinking about violence as a disciplinary technology, as something that is used by governments in intimate, in intimate spaces to regulate behavior, to determine the, the norms and, and shape the ways in which people interact with each other, and more often those who are viewed as less powerful than the person who is enacting violence. So violence is a tool of power. In 2023, at a policy dialogue, again, that was sort of on the back of this institute, on shrieking civic space and its meaning for gender and governance, in a discussion, in a panel discussion around sexualities, and I believe Pinky was on that panel, another speaker, laughing as he said this, the speaker happened to be a man, again, made the same argument that women invite violence. Of course, accompanying that was a, a broader conversation about anti-homosexuality being an African, and uh, he did not understand why we were having this conversation. What was quite interesting for me in that particular commentary is that that panel had not necessarily had any substantive debate on, anti on homosexuality at all. If it had been raised, it had been very tangential. It had not been a, a core focus of the panel. But somehow, that's the thing that sort of you know, uh, got this person riled up, in, in addition to talking about violence. Now, why do I begin with these two vignettes? I do so to highlight, but let me pause there. In both, of this, in, in, in both of these moments, there were very firm and clear interjections that were offered. 
around what we viewed as acceptable and unacceptable ways to engage in debates around questions of violence, when you do not know who is sitting around the room, you do not know who has experienced particular forms of violence as one way of thinking about that, but also to recognize the kind of theoretical and conceptual work that we had done in week one and the expectation that at this point, we should be able to, to link those two things together. But I'm arguing that this sort of interventions are not necessarily about the intellectual, right? And so when I offer this vignette, what I, I do so to highlight the fact that I've always been very intrigued by those who apply for the gender institutes, those who make the cut, and what they imagine they're coming to get from a gender institute. The first signal of what they imagine they're coming to get from the gender institute can always be picked up from the research proposals. Because as institute directors, you receive this proposal in, in advance. You offer comments to the laureates. And when they come to the institute, it is expected they've, they've already thought through some of those comments and that their presentations are sort of moving in a slightly different direction from what they had initially written. So in those research proposals, you begin to see the traces of the questions that preoccupy people around what they construct as gender. You also begin to see in that process the scholarship they choose to engage with and that which they choose not to engage with, even when they know these scholars. So again, this is not an issue of access that I talked about, but this is now a question of the choices that people are making around citation, around which scholarship they see as useful to expanding their own research work. Often in these two traces that I've talked about, we see the demand that was made yesterday to focus on the woman question, to focus on the personhood of women. In these research proposals, you also see an interpretation of patriarchy that does not move beyond an articulation of the male-female biology, binary, but rather solidifies the power and powerlessness embedded in those binaries as the site from which to define research problems and resolve them. To make this argument around the importance of us moving away from these binaries or the importance of us thinking, the, thinking about the value of these binaries to understanding gender much more broadly is not to argue that I don't recognize the material realities, the real ways in which these ideas of biology, male, female, womanhood and, 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 and masculinity structure our very gendered society. But the invitation that we are often making is for us to think about the liberation potential that a much more expansive interpretation of gender would offer us to reinterpret and reorganize power. Again, Professor Tameli highlighted yesterday through the scholarship of many other feminists uh, writing about the African continent, from the African continent, that our own histories offer us these very expansive ways of understanding gender. And why is it that we are resistant to thinking with that material as part of developing our own research processes? This, for me, is as much about a politics of naming, right? How I frame myself, my ideological position, which then allows you to see how it is that I intervene in debates. But I argue it's much more than that. So the questions about feminism, for me, is not whether I choose to name myself a feminist. I think it's important, but we lose sight of why feminism matters to the framing of gender institutes. And that is because it is attached to theoretical and methodological imperatives. Let me give you an example, and I will return to London now for a minute. At SOAS, we have a department of economics. It's called the Department of Economics. But that department makes very clear that what we do in this department is heterodox economics. So when you come here and you want to work for the World Bank, this might not necessarily be the place that this economics degree will help you. Now, if you come and you leave the degree and say, actually, this thing about the World Bank is absolutely ridiculous, because over the four to three years of my undergraduate degree or master's and PhD program, I've learned to think in much more critical ways about how global economies are structured and how power is invested in particular institutions to the detriment of particular countries, regions, and peoples of the world, then the, the degree has done its work because it has shifted the ways in which you're thinking about mac macroeconomics and microeconomics. Why, therefore, does feminism matter? It's the same principle. When the economics department tells people it's heterodox economics, they're not lied to you. You don't come in and say, I came to do an economics degree that looks like this. We told you when you're coming in. When a gender institute is framed 
as being grounded in feminist theory, feminist concepts, feminisms broadly, you're already signaling to the applicant, this is what you should be expecting. You're not expecting gender and development. You're expecting to be challenged. You're expecting to think critically about questions of gender, sexualities, and all of the interconnected issues that make the world go around and the centrality of gender as an organizing principle for our societies. So in boldly naming the gender institutes as grounded in feminist thinking, as we have seen over time, I have seen the power of that naming as somebody who has been a resource person and a director. Because what it does is that it allows the ghosts and monsters that haunt us to come out. Those two examples above were illustrated of people who walked into the institute thinking they're coming to a particular kind of gender program, right? And the minute you introduced the feminist approaches, methodologies, and theoretical approaches to thinking about those questions, all of their ghosts came out, right? All of their biases came out, and that's important. It might be irritating for the, for, 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 for the lecturer, but it is a powerful moment to then begin to lift apart the layers. That's, that, for me, is, is the, the importance. It's not a wave, it's not a fad. It's about recognizing that this thing we call gender, the container that developed gender is feminism. Feminism did not follow gender. Gender is as a result of feminist scholarship that gave us the language of gender as an analytical tool, the framing that allows us to see how gender is a powerful organizing principle across our economies, societies, politically, and across other structures, including the church amongst others. And finally, I believe by naming or centering feminism, it also allows us to anchor the space around a set of principles in which, for instance, the reproduction of violence as a form of debate and intellectual engagement is rejected, right? And we remember the human in having difficult and complex conversations. Remember, I'm not saying that you do not engage in debate. It is how you engage in that debate that matters without necessarily reproducing the violence that as feminists, irrespective of our sort of uh, ways in which we end up feminisms, because they're different approaches and ways of thinking about feminist politics, theories and actions, that reproducing violence should not be the project that we engage in, because it is that violence that we are seeking to unseat and, and, and think about power in ways that does not produce violence remains our mission, even if we may continue to produce violence through the kinds of discourses that we engage in in our journey around building our feminist politics. I now want to move to the second, part, second and final part of my intervention this morning, to think through the idea of gender feminisms and intellectual imperatives. I came across this saying, which again, you know, some of these things are often obvious, but you know, the power of statements is that when somebody is able to capture so powerfully something that you've been thinking about, this is why we cite them. So uh, a Lebanese scholar called Maya Mikdashi says that gender is not about what is, but how what is came to be. And I want to use this sort of framing as an anchor for us to think about what are the intellectual imperatives that potentially Cardassia in its next iteration of gender institutes needs to begin to think about. In offering that as an opening statement, I'm inviting us over today and tomorrow that as we have discussions around gender, let's focus on how what is came to be rather than reaffirming these ideas around gender that we are not necessarily unpacking in, in necessarily meaningful ways. And I cannot have this discussion without starting here in Uganda. I do know that I need to go back home, but I cannot uh, do so without starting here in Uganda. I think all of you are familiar and aware of the fact that uh, recently in May, uh, 26 May, the, the president of, of this country assented to what is called the anti-homosexuality bill, so now it's an act, that turns into law a wide-ranging uh, set of things that includes a 10-year jail term for what is referred to as attempted homosexuality, a death sentence for aggravated homosexuality. Now this act is a sort of reprisal and expansion of a previous one in 2009 that was famously known as the Bahati Bill that was thwarted then by a technicality because of a lack of a quorate parliament. Now, the Ugandans in the room, there are people who have been involved in, in this much more than I am, including those who are leading a petition right now to challenge that, uh, uh, Sylvia and others 
would be able to speak to this much more expansively. But the Ugandan law, as far as I'm concerned, is not isolated, as some of you who've been following these debates know. It is reflective of a spate of laws across Africa that are argued to protect the heterosexual African family, to protect African values, a rejection of Western norms. Similar laws have been seen in Ghana, in Kenya, my own country. Uh, in July, eight members of the Ghanaian parliament proposed what they were calling the promotion of proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values. In April of 2023, a member of parliament who I'm not going to, a Kenyan member of parliament who I'll not bother giving you his name, declared that he had introduced the Family Protection Bill, which among other things prohibits access to sexual health services, sexual health rights uh, education, including an intervention on pronouns uh, as, as a sort of uh, uh, offense that can be punished by the law. What is interesting for me and what is interesting in scholars of sexuality around this is that in corralling these movable notions of African culture, Christianity, because for those of you who are Christians in the room, Christians generally do everything else other than be Christian, right? So Christianity becomes a sort of uh, thing they invoke, but everything else they're doing all of the time is never the things that are prescribed in, in the Bibles that they work with, right? So in corralling these movable notions of African culture, Christianity, and family, and I apologize to the Christians I may have offended in the room, we, we can meet at tea time and, and discuss this. I was raised Catholic, went through Catholic boarding school, so maybe that's my trauma I'm bringing into the room. These bills crack down on basic sex, sexual and reproductive health services, education, including access to life-saving HIV and AIDS services. And while claiming to target gender and sexually diverse people, what they in effect mobilize is very specific notions of heterosexuality that are designed to reconstitute a conservative interpretation of gender relations and laws. These laws are not about protecting the family, but a desire to illustrate and discipline an expansive thought that challenges the unstable power that is attached to heterosexuality. When something is unstable, the only ways to stabilize it is to place controls around it. And this fear of the other, the fear of non-heterosexuality, is really an illustration, as far as I'm concerned, of the instability of heterosexuality itself as a construct, both as a form of organizing sexual relations, but as a form of structuring and organizing our entire societies. So it's not just about sexuality. Heterosexuality then becomes the frame of organizing and structuring our entire societies. And so this is a, is a move that is vested in certain forms of dominant masculinities and a reliance in constructing womanhood in ways that sustains it. Do permit me to uh, quote at length um, uh, my, my friend and uh, former classmate, Danai, who, whose piece in 2008, I, I, I don't know how she feels about this piece anymore, but it's one that I continue to teach and cite to students, which was on researching gender and sexuality. I think allows us to see what I'm speaking about in relation to disciplinary technologies and the instability on heterosexuality. Mupotsa says, growing up in Zimbabwe, the contentious issues surrounding being a woman, dressing for, occupying public space, maintaining respectability, and social reproduction became fairly clearly to me, became fairly clear to me, as I was often policed and controlled into the appropriate modes of conduct for a young woman the constant and consistent reminders of appropriate management strategies of and for women's bodies and sexuality, as I experienced them in Harare, drew me to consider the historical underpinnings of what my peers described to me as our culture. Interrogating this national culture, it became clear that at the crask of constructs of tradition and modernity, in these discussions were women's bodies the success or failure of the project of national culture, if we were to call it that, appears to be placed at the national family's ability to manage and control the mobility and sexuality of women's bodies, be it through mothers, fathers, brothers, or on the streets of Harare to the police force. Integral to that control are the subjects we, as respectable women, speak about and under what conditions. I think this particular uh, citation that I'm offering here expands for me the point that I'm making earlier around the instability of heterosexuality, 
the ways in which heterosexuality is mobilized to structure our society, but also that in speaking about homosexuality, what happens often is reinforcing particular ways of femininity and masculinity in that society. One of the things that I say often, and many people who have heard me speak elsewhere will, remember, will, will, will have heard this so much that they must be tired of it. When they are coming for the so-called homosexuals and the lesbians, they are coming for you, straight, respectable, heterosexual women. They are actually saying that in order for that other thing to not be the thing that we consider normative, this other thing has to be normative. And it does not require you to remain with your freedom, your, your great education, your access to the job market, your ability to choose whether you own things or whether you have children or whether you don't. It actually reinscribes very specific norms around how your womanhood should be performed and how masculinity should be performed in societies. So even if you're not interested in the homosexuals, be interested in the freedoms that are bound to be curtailed for you because those projects work together in very powerful ways. Adjacent to this homosexuality builds and the contagion effect that it's ha having across different parts of the African continent is its transnational nature, particularly the connection between who funds these projects in Africa and the evolution of adjacent discourses in Europe and the, in the UK specifically where I live where the role of, uh, of uh, the law as a disciplinary device to police particular groups, to rewrite gender norms, and redefine whose lives are worth living and which lives are worth saving, is developing quite significantly in sections of Latin America, across Europe and America. But what is important for this conversation as well, as I move along, is the role of the evangelical churches, not just in sort of the funding and support, as you saw with Scott, uh, American evangelist Scott Lively's role in the Bahati Bill of 2009, the role of some development funding going towards councils such as the Interreligious Council of Uganda, but is the fact that these evangelical groups are also becoming very critical political lobby groups in Brazil. The biggest group of people that Bolsonaro was seeking to appeal to were the Christian evangelicals. In the US, the biggest group of people who are mobilized, mobilizing white nationalist discourse. Again, here is where the connections for those who want to say this homosexuality thing is an African, it's abominable, it's against God. Remember that that debate in other parts of the world is closely linked to a racialized anti-black debate. So do not imagine that in rejecting your fellow brothers and sisters, you are supposedly a better African or a better black as a result of that. Because in Europe and in America, the debates around anti-homosexuality, the debates around uh, gender diversity and the trans debates are closely intertwined with racialized conversations, are closely intertwined with a rejection and a sort of reassertion of the inferior place that the black population occupies in the world. Now, the idea of fundamentalisms and the transnational is equally critical for three main reasons, because I think I want to draw attention here to what it is that they mobilize amongst many of our communities. Why are these groups particularly keen on, uh, why are particular sections of our society uh, attached or are easily attracted to this conversation beyond the idea that the patriarchs, right? There is something more that is happening here. Fundamentalisms, which are often used to describe a religious reaction against certain aspects of modernity, can be traced back to the impact of colonialisms, European colonialisms, across most, part of the, most parts of the global south, and is distinctly linked to the idea of the erasure, destruction, and the loss of status of traditional religious laws and courts in a number of these countries. So you see that when I talk about Christian fundamentalisms, you will see that mirrored in sort of the Islamic fundamentalisms that also go on including Hindutva in, in, in India, including you know, some of the debates that happen around uh, you know, uh, for, uh, the currently occupied territory of Palestine. The rapid marginalization of indigenous cultures whilst simultaneously co-opting religious elites led to the emergence of fundamentalisms in all world religions from the late 1800s to the early 1900s as attempts to fill the cultural vacuum left by the breakdown of indigenous uh, religious authority. 
So this is, these are the moments in which you begin to see the spread and the development of groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood, Hindu nationalism, can all be traced to this particular period. Why is it important to pay attention to fundamentalisms as they occur through religion and, and their transnational nature and the resourcing that accompanies it is the, that, number one, most fundamentalist projects will opportunistically mobilize anti-Western and anti-colonial as the basis for their mobilization. So all of the people who feel attached or, or, uh, or latch on to these ideas about uh, uh, particular norms being non-African are drawing and relying on the opportunistic mobilization of anti-Western and anti-colonial as the basis to frame what this project offers for thinking about freedom and liberation of particular groups in rejection of imperialism. Second is the fact that there are varying degrees of overlap between fundamentalism and ethno-nationalism. Radical nationalist movements combine religion with nationalism, which are seen as threat to sexual, uh, secular nationalism. So for instance, uh, in Germany, the, a party called Alternative uh, for Deutschland rejects gender education as an intervention in the natural development of children and parents' rights to educate their children. It invokes the idea of gender ideology, which was first used and can be traced to the Vatican in 2001 uh, in, a, in a statement by John Paul II, who declared that the misleading concepts concerning sexuality and the dig dignity and the mission of women that are driven by specific ideologies of women. So gender ideology, as is now invoked by a lot of these groups, references or seeks to deny, um, uh, argues that what these gender ideologies do deny or marginalize natural difference between the sexes, denies traditional values and specific roles within the family. And important for this room is that gender research does not meet the claim of reputable research. Its methods do not fulfill the criteria of science as its objectives are primarily politically motivated. The third and critical point, as we can see in how these movements are translating into laws in specific country, is the fact that there are varying degrees of political engagement and involvement amongst fundamentalist groups. And there are distinctions here between the radical right and extreme right, with the radical right being hostile to liberal democracy but accept popular sovereignty and the minimal procedures of parliamentary democracy. So they seek to gain support of the people by critiquing crucial aspects of liberal democracy, such as pluralism and minority rights. Extreme right organizations are often inspired by fascism or national uh, socialism and believe in a system ruled by individuals who possess special leadership characteristics and are therefore naturally different from the rest of the people. So let me close with four observations. As I started at the beginning, I said I wanted to anchor this keynote around two major pillars, the methodology of the gender institutes, and to think about where we might go, or Cordesia might go, over the next 10 years, if we were to think about it in that way. I do want to emphasize that, of course, I speak as an academic who researches and writes on particular issues. So the vantage point through which I enter conversations are always framed by that. There's no idea of neutrality here. Uh, let's be clear about that. So four observations. This current moment, whether you're a scholar of gender and sexuality, or whether you're a scholar of peace and security, or whether you're a scholar of, of, of agrarian studies, for instance, is a moment that is framed by the battle of ideas. Threats, as we are seeing to gender and feminist studies, is not just about these centers and their value or their scientific nature, it's about the very threat to scholarship that challenges how we, how we understand and organize the world. What that scholarship poses to the organizing structures of our society, that is what is at threat. We see this not only with uh, gender and uh, feminist centers across the world, but we can see it in the debates around critical race theory and critical race uh, uh, centers across the US specifically. <coughs> But the attacks on gender studies centers is a particular one that's useful for this conversation. So if there was ever a moment in which Cordesia wanted to say we want to rethink the value of a gender institute, indeed over the last 28 years we've done our work, I would say no. The work is more urgent 
now, particularly given the constituency that the institute tends to attract, who are not the people we are often teaching in our classrooms or who we are engaging in the conferences that we go to. The second is the link between the notions of citizenship and the nation state, the juridical structures of the state as we occupy them, I'm a Kenyan, I'm a Tanzanian, etc. We cannot delink the sort of debates that are happening around queer groups, queer people, the debates that are happening around race and gender, the debates that are linked between race, gender, and migration, and migration is a very classed and racialized conversation, as one that is not fundamentally about redrawing geopolitical borders and asserting particular notions of citizenship, rights, entitlement, and the place of the nation state in redefining those borders and boundaries. So as you write about violence against women, or as you write about a, a land and access to land, that is fundamentally, as far as I'm concerned, a conversation that's sitting at the nexus between who is considered a citizen, what rights and entitlements they have by virtue of the body that they are homed in, and how society interprets the embodiment of their citizenship as a basis to negotiate what rights they can and cannot have. The third is around the notion of new, new battlegrounds around old issues. Here is the question of the centrality of gender and sexuality, the centrality of the body. Feminists often say the body is the first territory. And we see that emerging again and again in all of the conversations that I've alluded to above. And finally, my clarion call always is that as we see conversations around gender, around feminisms, around the intersections between anti-blackness or racialized migrant labor in its different forms uh, across the world, we, I hope we, but I can say I, observe the very transnational nature of these conversations. The debates that we are having on, on the African continent cannot be disconnected from other actors who are well-resourced, who are funding these debates and fueling them in these parts of the world. And to say that is not to release responsibility from our own patriarchs, progressive and otherwise, who are also sustaining these particular ideas through their own uh, legislative battlefields or other forms of political theaters. So if the Gender Institute is seen as a strategy for organizing, if we take seriously that knowledge production and its transfer is also a strategy for organizing and pushing discursive change, shaping discourses, then the place of the transnational, both perhaps Godwin in the way we structure the institutes, which might deal with some of the challenges I spoke about around access and, uh, and uh, the evolution of intellectual debate and trajectories must require that we center the transnational in how we frame and think about future institutes and how we are concerted in drawing those links consistently. There are specificities to the issues that we face on the African continent. Context does matter. But in a lot of the broader issues that concern us and which are shaping the world today, the transnational does matter a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Awino. What a powerful uh, speech, a powerful intervention, rich ideas, thought-provoking, a lot of material for us at Codistria to think about in shaping our strategic plan, the future of Codistria and the Gender Institutes. Thanks ever so much. I will now call upon Pearl as the respondent before we offer some remarks and uh, open up the floor for discussion. So Pearl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Aweno, for making my job so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much. I, I really wanted to start here. Thank you very much, Kodesria. You actually deserve a whole lot of confessions um, because there are a whole lot of uh, admirers and beneficiaries of Kodesria through the years down south that are sitting there and we're sitting there wondering when do we directly interface with this organization. I won't leave this podium without just mentioning the name and ending it there 
um, in, 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 in terms of Professor Mafeji and his incubation into this particular organization and hopefully his contribution too. So thank you very much. We are who we are because you have been who you are. I just wanted to um, appreciate the depth of the, by how we know, today in relation to everything else that we listened to yesterday. Yesterday, actually, for those of us who, 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 who were admiring from a distance, was a powerful, I, I don't want to say summary because it waters it down, but it was a powerful induction into the kind of strife and struggle um, that we've done through Cordesria conceptually, first and foremost, as well as in terms of the, the agency and the work that has been done um, over the years. I know that uh, Prof. Morunga is pining for a, 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 a something that will influence his strategic um, uh, thinking moving forward, that he is pining for intervention, intentionality of intervention moving forward, but yesterday alone was rich enough for all of us to distill that. And then we come to today where we actually have a um, fundamental epistemic underpinnings for why yesterday was so important. Um, this morning we have seen some serious justice to the osmosis of conceptual conversations. And your emphasis, um, Awino, in relation to your first strand of your talk around the issues of research and teaching, around tracking the, 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 the influences via, even if it is via citations, and I know that when we say cita citations, we often imagine them in written form. But there, uh, there is a, ho a whole range of citation and influences that comes out of spaces like this that gets carried forward in all forms of means, including such means elsewhere, that um, you have just been emphasizing on. And then eventually talking about the spaces of conversing all the way through to the classroom and how um, what is coming out of such uh, two-week forums with um, um, uh, Cordesria has a way of engendering conversations. And you are actually showing how that is ne not necessarily prescriptive, but how it gives the authority to converse. I mean, I think that actually distills for us what is nebulous about what what is it that we have achieved i know that is one of the frustrations that we have been what is it that that cordesria has achieved and if we were to look at scholars conversing in different forums beyond cordesria and going with the precise inclination not to prescribe but to open the discourse for core influences. I think it summarizes what Cordesia has done up, um, so far. I also noted, and I will do my own confessions in the end, about how you've swayed my thinking in relation to um, um, a, a policy in particular. But I also have noted the various struggles around communication, which are beyond language, which are also conceptual, which are also influenced by the institutional parameters that we operate in that define what, is, what has integrity and what does not have integrity in terms of where we voice our ideas. 
the whole issue around discernment of of influence discerning what is right and wrong in, in other words moving towards establishing value and in this particular argument i, I note that you are also um lobbying for the feminist discourse to be there because it's it's going to fulfill the task of making sure that specific values particularly in your articulation of it around violence and how people carelessly still handle the advent of violence because they have other um, priorities around what is proper in terms of culture and how what is the place of women in relation to support even if you're not using those particular terms but the discernment around what is to be expected as a set of values in the discussion that will take us forward conceptually is something that I valued quite a lot in what you were saying um, in, 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 in framing the, the discourse that will take us forward, whether we are gender studies or whether we are feminists in terms of this cause. But I also note, especially when you are, are talking around the questions of the, the intellectual imperatives, that uh, I'm glad that you repeated. You, you did not shy away from repeating your statement about when they come for uh, homosexuality, they are coming for you, because I think that is so powerful. It is the fundamental basis of some of the debates that hold us back as we pine to perfect conceptions, generally in terms of identities, but more so in terms of feminism and in terms of women's studies in particular. We tend to shy away from um, asserting um, the identities that we are lobbying for um, um, but at the same time we assert them so much that we valorize them and do not see the implications in particular of the conceptual disjunctures that we create and so by the time we are so African in our orientation that we want this kind of uniqueness of African feminism. We do not necessarily see some of the babies that we throw with the bathwater in terms of the throwing away of the discourse of social justice generally. Because in that kind of seeking to be purely African, there are certain things that we also endorse about who we are in exclusion to others. So there's this thin line that we need to strike about punting the discourse of groups that are excluded, but at the same time using the conceptual tools that we must claim because we are all entitled to them. I'm not going to be long because I wasn't giving a keynote myself, but I just want to take stock as I close in terms of what are the takeaways that I, I note and confess my own uh, influences towards myself as I open the floor through the chair for others to react, disagree, and, um, and comment and or take the debate forward. The first thing is really the method of taking stock of the conceptual myth, uh, conversations. I personally, in my own work, have been worried, seriously worried, about how we underplay qualitative studies in the bid to fit with all of these kinds of institutional formats that we, are go, we, we go for. And so when someone talks about a strategic plan, I agree we need to be structured but at the same time, we must be structured in a way that allows for conversations, 
allows for projects to maneuver a kind of evolution of their own. And therefore, in the work of Cordesria, as you frame yourselves for the next five years, I would take note of what has been said and, and been illustrated this morning about allowing for conceptual conversations to happen, making sure that there is enough spaces that gather thought that is likely to influence moving forward. The second issue that I wanted to highlight, and at the back of my mind is also everything else that Cordesra is pining to do, is, as I have said, the dangers of pining for conceptual and epistemic perfection before lodging a struggle. Gender, struggle, feminism is not a normal analysis like we, we, we often do in pure disciplines, if there is ever anything like that in the social sciences in the first place, but we know that the downfall of social sciences is to mimic what goes on in hard sciences. But it is more urgent for gender studies to actually realize that qualitative methodologies um, the, are the way to, 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 to remove us from the suffocation of pining for conceptual perfection. And this is particularly important um, in the work um, that we are doing and in the kind of plea that we had this morning because we have multiple contexts at the same time we are trying to weave in um, a kind of struggle that combines all of us. There are tools from which we have been excluded. That's why I appreciated the Dean's frustration yesterday that African feminism <laughs> is feminism because it speaks to this dilemma of, on the one hand, we are looping for a group that has serious issues. On the other hand, we mustn't eject ourselves from being entitled to tools that matter and for which we are also entitled. So um, the, the, the takeaway from this is that as we pine for epistemic justice, we need to allow ourselves to immediately start with contextual issues. Whether it is the challenges that we had yesterday being articulated um, around Muslim women and respect that they will have their own challenges, and appreciate the articulation contextually, but at the same time um, being entitled to the kind of discourse that happens in forums like this and the tools that are generated from that in order to advance the struggle of women. We will be accused of selling out on epistemic uniqueness. We will, eventually. I can, can't imagine that future generations will be silent uh, when they hear that we were so trans and internationalistic about things that we um, forgot about the specificities, which will pan out in a particular way in future because life evolves. But at the same time, we must not expunge ourselves from the universal freedoms. In fact, one of the dilemmas that I live with personally as a scholar, it is to argue without necessarily being grapes or sour about it, that this thing that we call Western science is a fallacy. Because science, we all have an inclination to be scientific for as long as we can all strive to think objectively, at the same time as strive to think cosmologically the way that we want to. Okay, so I don't want to digress too much. But when you were articulating, and, and thirdly, um, uh, uh, when you were articulating about gender and the, and the political motivation of the gender research and the political motivation of the discourse, uh, even, if it is, it is, if, even if it is something that I paraphrase myself, um, I think that we must never let down on the 
activism part of, of, of things. In other words, I am saying, and this is where my conf confession is relevant, around policy. Because yesterday when I commented, I said maybe we are, we are swaying too much into policy and we are getting ourselves off, out of the space of activism. I do realize, especially as you emphasize the structures, as you emphasize the politics um, or the state structures, as you emphasize the link between identities racially, sec in terms of sexuality, in terms of migrations, that we are actually in a space of politicized formality. This thing that we call formality and official dom is actually a resource that can be abused by those who are in it in order to shun the identities that are not fully entitled to it. And therefore, as Codestria strategizes, they won't only be strategizing methodologically in order to infuse the qualitative elements of designing their strategy. They will also be strategizing around these stakeholders that hold official dom that hold formality in terms of when it is that we're not just meeting as academics, but we're meeting with structures of formality with an agenda. We are meeting with structures that devise funding mechanisms with a subtle agenda after caucusing <laughs> because formality and official dom is something that is a resource that gets abused by those in power because the power relationships are structural. I also wanted to say that, um, as I close, that the thing that you call the battle of ideas influences me to think around how, as women, we sometimes lose the right to be ourselves now. In other words, we are either African in some kind of uh, imagined past of what Africanness should be, and therefore I can't be Pell Sitole because Pell is a colonial name. Who knows why I choose to call myself that and what it, where does it fit for me to be pale as opposed to be pale and and who what experience i've had before of being shunned because i could not be named i could not be called easily it doesn't matter so my own personal struggles now in 2023 about what i choose and choose not to do disqualify me from being something proper in the eyes of someone who's using a particular lens. The battle of ideas that we should be looking for now, because we are entitled to be scientific, because science is a communal construct, and the tools are all of our tools, we're all contributing to them, um, because we are entitled to official domain formality. And how we relate to it is our own choice, depending on what we want to gain from it. So the battle of who I want to be now and the liberations to be who I want to be now, whether as myself or as my group, needs to be the stance and the standpoint of how we approach the issue of particularisms as we fight for gender universally. It's complicated, but it has to be done. And so when you talk about the battle of, 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 of ideas, it makes me remember how when a woman blunders, we don't even have a right to blunder as ourselves. When a woman blunders, she blunders for all of us. I can't just blunder as Pelsi Tole in a leadership position. Everyone is going to be, look at the women. Like, in what sense am I all of the women all of a sudden? So, so the issue here is let us claim the right to be now in the 21st century and let us desist from 
getting the pressure of the branding of the category, whether it's a historical category or it is a category of, of, of the brand of being a woman, in order to be able to fit in with these context, sorry, these conceptual um, issues that would otherwise have stifled us into a corner. Chair, I'm too excited. I could go on forever. I have to stop myself, but I'm just really excited, Awino, to have listened to how your your talk gels with everything else that we had listened to yesterday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill for opening up the conversation even further after our powerful speaker, our keynote. Um, it seems to me that some of the questions and concerns that were raised yesterday are beginning to get even more significant after listening to our two speakers this morning, the respondent and the keynote speaker. Particularly the one that struck me yesterday was someone, I can't remember who exactly, who raised this question about why is Kadisria shifting from gender to feminist uh, sort of values uh, and, and feminism and the feminist consciousness that some of us are actually projecting and wanting to advance. And uh, after listening to Reno Cage, I, I, I begin to think that um, uh, the years of teaching that I have personally done and the years of learning that I have personally done, having been, having been a student in Mauritius at secondary level and having been to the UK and Australia and other parts of the world for further studies, I find that this question of decolonization of the mind that Professor Tamale was speaking about yesterday becomes extremely important in this conversation. Because as we teach our young people, whether in the gender institutes or whether in our sites of learning and our universities and campuses, I find that there is so much of unlearning that we have to do with them to be able to actually get a different kind of paradigm, a different kind of interrogations, different kind of questionings that can come through, particularly more so when we're talking about gender and feminism. And that is critical at this particular juncture. That said, I will not uh, pretend to summarize any of this or raise questions, but I think that this gives us an extremely exciting opportunity to open up this conversation, make your comments, bring your contributions, and perhaps in some ways or the other, help to assist Kodisri on the way forward. I have some ideas as well. I think that the idea, the one idea that I retain that I've been very strong upon um, in terms of what um, Rita was saying about the tracer study, I think that's extremely important because we need to give a voice to those who have actually been for it and concerned and having been for it and their experiences to be able to assess and gauge the difference that we've been able to make, if at all, and where has that led us? But more importantly, and this is the last comment that I want to make this morning before I open up the floor, is that after listening to these two reflections, the respondent and the keynote speaker, particularly at this critical juncture where the world is becoming so much more complex, multipolar, with different levels of authoritarianism that we're seeing, where our rights are being trampled upon in so very many ways to which Irina speaks about, we wonder, I wonder, and it's a question that I raise, uh, whether an increased level of feminist consciousness can actually help us to make the world a better place, a more just place, particularly on the continent in Africa. And how this question of methods, conceptualizations, tools that we are beginning, that we've been developing but one point that uh, Arena also makes, and which is extremely important, is context. We have evolved. The times are no longer the same. It's different, and we need to try and perhaps undo some of the things that we've done in the past and bring up new levels of thinking with the new emerging challenges that we are facing. On this note, I would like to open the floor to a first round of questions and comments. 
Uh, before I start, I would like to say that I have a very poor vision. I have a problem with my eyesight at the moment, and I can't read the names. So please raise your hands very well and give us your name and then put your question or comments. We'll start on this side to facilitate. Yeah. So the first lady here and then, uh, yeah, Pinky, and then we'll take a first round. Tout le monde prend son casque. <rire> Merci beaucoup, Sheila. Vous voyez que je suis très pressée de prendre la parole. Parce que ce débat est extrêmement important de mon point de vue. Et on ne peut pas aujourd'hui faire l'histoire des concepts sans les replacer dans un contexte historique. Je dis qu'on ne peut pas ignorer l'histoire par rapport à l'émergence des concepts. Est-ce que tous les concepts sont applicables à une société donnée, à un temps donné, ou est-ce que les concepts eux-mêmes évoluent par rapport justement aux sociétés déterminées. Ça, je pense que le débat conceptuel, on ne peut pas l'ignorer dans l'histoire et dans les instituts du Code industriel. Je prends le cas du féminisme. Tout le monde sait dans quel contexte le féminisme est né. Dans un contexte patriarcal où il y avait une oppression véritable sur les femmes et avec aussi des transformations liées, qu'on le veuille ou non, à l'émergence d'une classe ouvrière, de la nécessité d'avoir des ouvrières aussi. Et le, les transformations sociales issues de la société industrielle ont joué un rôle important dans l'émergence des concepts au 19e siècle. Qu'est-ce qui se passe aujourd'hui Dans la situation, par exemple, de la sexualité, que, que Aueno a présenté avec, avec brio, peut être considérée comme une révolution dans, un, dans des sociétés qui sont passées par la simonie depuis la féodalité. Mais il y a eu une évolution et des transformations sociales. Qu'en est-il des sociétés africaines qui subissent des acculturations, introduisant le patriarcat et ayant transformé en profondeur les sociétés africaines Et vous me dites, que nous devons avoir le même type de débat qu'en Occident sans procéder à la transformation sociale et arriver à un système d'individuation réel dans nos sociétés. C'est ça la, le grand débat que nous avons. La question de l'homosexualité. Par exemple, quand on prend une société comme la société sénégalaise, les homosexuels ont toujours existé, protégés dans la société, et on leur avait conféré un rôle, et on voit même des groupes ethniques où l'homosexualité existe véritablement, surtout dans la région de Dakar, et ça n'a jamais posé de problème. Mais à partir du moment où on a voulu en faire un débat public, ça a braqué la société et le conservatisme a pris le dessus sur le reste de la société. Alors qu'est-ce qu'il faut absolument faire pendant ce temps-là Et je crois que nous n'avons pas assez interrogé nos sociétés, et je vais terminer par dire qu'il y a des questions que nous éludons et qui sont des questions importantes. Par exemple, les intellectuels se mobilisent très peu pour la question de la polygamie, par exemple. Ce n'est pas notre débat. C'est-à-dire -ce que la question de la décolonialité du débat revient en force parce que le débat nous vient de l'extérieur. Et ce débat qui nous vient de l'extérieur pour guider nos, 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 nos préoccupations braque les sociétés, malheureusement, et nous laissons de côté ce qui doit faire ce qui doit contribuer à la modernité, à la transformation et à l'égalité entre l'homme et la femme. Donc moi, je pense que nous devons aussi voir quelles sont les, nos préoccupations et qu'est-ce que nous voulons aussi pour arriver au même niveau de transformation et de modernité que dans les sociétés occidentales. Merci. Merci, Pengue. Oui, Pinky. Um, th thank you very much. I, I want especially to echo the thanks to Awino for a total through the force. Um, so rich was your intervention this morning that there are so many um, threads that one could pull it. 
but I thought um, having, uh, especially in the room, students of uh, feminism and gender especially, I should stay with one. Um, I, 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 I keep vacillating between, do I comment on the, the question of the, the evangelical groups and um, say traditional spirituality and, and Sylvia did speak to um, sexualities um, and the linkage to indigenous um, indigenous knowledge yesterday being a Sangoma myself or do I come to this point that you make about the violent expressions of discomfiture um, in these meetings that we have evidence um, and you you spoke to two specific examples and we had another one um, yesterday across theories across moments of um, knowledge making so to speak in the same manner as i see for instance your question of why do we think as we do as dialoguing uh, with that of our colleague yesterday. How do we know uh, what we know? And this is what I, I, I thought about. Tony Morrison, uh, that many people will know in, in, this, in this team, um, writes um, about a moment where a man and a woman during uh, slavery uh, having an intimate moment in the bush. A car comes and it of course casts light on these two. Two white men come out of the car, they approach the couple, and of course immediately that moment of intimacy turns into performance, theatricality. As the two men begin to jeer at the black man, asking him to continue performing, as it were, show us that you remain, continue having sex. He gets angry, and of course, what was intimate, what should be sex, becomes violence as he gets mad at the woman given that his body is failing him. And so he's not able to demonstrate that which he would not have wanted to demonstrate in the first place. This is a critical moment, in my view, a key framing point for black male-female polarity that should not be lost. This also gives us a black male perspective in the formation and performance of maleness as is expected of him. This links in my thinking then to the perspective on the expression, the performance of national culture as it were that is expected of a woman that are we know uh, speaks of in reference to that quote uh, from our colleague um, Mopoza, that it is not only women who feel that they carry this burden, that it is also men, and that quite often the male voice is left out in these discussions, in part because there isn't that much in the discourse uh, that you will actually find. And I have found, for instance, in the work, and it is only one, one, um, it's a set of short stories, it's not a novel, by Mtutuzeli Machoba, published in the 1970s, Call Me Not a Man, where he writes stories of the burden of performing maleness, as it were. And in there, you find traces of, if you like, foundations of violence as performance of maleness that the black man feels 
he has to do because this is apartheid South mm -hmm. Africa and it means one thing or another depending on who you are to be black to be male and therefore to perform your role as it were a clear picture then of moments or traces to a moment of fissure in what we would perhaps call the traditional indigenous framing yeah. of gender in the manner in which scholars mm -hmm. like Ifia Madiumi um, that you reference as well uh, would uh, offer to us. And I think these are important that we get the dialoguing happening. And I'm aware that there will be uh, discussions around masculinities, but just to signpost as it were. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll take on this side first, and I'll come to the other side. Yes, yourself. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this mind-opening presentation, uh, Awino. Um, one of the aspects I've picked is that feminist educators, uh, researchers, have a passion for their teaching, for their research, uh, which is driven by a world that is not yet. And in this case, I see that uh, the standpoint of a feminist researcher or scholar is really political and it is transformative and it is intended to develop feminist analysis that reform, that inform um, the personal ways of acting. So um, my question or point of reflection is that most feminist researchers are really following the research agenda that is not set by them. And, and in this case, the, 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 the one who sets the research agenda may not be interested in the feminist agenda. And so my question is, how do we, come this, how do we overcome this invisible hand that operates within our research uh, spaces so that as we do research that is transformative, we remain feminists who are focused on transform transforming a world where women can not only can fit but can easily act and, and, and be free to engage in, the, in, in this kind of world. And, and so these are two feminists kind of where one is driven by passion and another may be driven by li livelihood. So how do we disentangle, how do we work on this area of setting the research agenda. Thank you. We'll take another free and then give a chance uh, to the panelists, uh, to the keynote and the respondent to respond. So let's take free in this first row and I'll get back to you. Yes? Yes? Yes. Patricia. <laughs> oh, you know, um, thank you very much for this excellent um, conference. So, uh, agreeing with Penda has just uh, said, um, for instance, in Guinea Bissau, uh, the question of um, homosexuality has always exist, existed, for instance, between the Mankanya people, so, and never been a problem. So, uh, from your research experience, your empirical experience taking uh, the Kenyan example, um, are there uh, other or alternative concept conceptualizations or understandings uh, of what uh, is being men and women from your empirical research that can uh, help to understand and to go beyond uh, that what this gender um, conceptualization is that what we understand from about this. Uh, second, um, how the Kenyan diaspora, from your experience, of course, uh, is influencing and vice versa. How is uh, uh, Kenya is influencing its diaspora? on this issue and what are the implications for knowledge production? Thank you. 
thank you, thank you for, for giving me a chance to ask this uh, question. So I am an anthropologist, and uh, um, my my training in the behavior science really uh, is deep rooted in everyday life. Assess what is happening now, and that is evidence <coughs> which is espoused. Later on, I will uh, discuss our ongoing research with over 45 countries. And this is about everyday life. What we realize is that everyday life is a bit different from what these current debates are about. Uh, so, for instance, uh, people's sexuality can be, can be like, if you, if you assess somebody's uh, typical day. Uh, sexuality is like 11 minutes of a typical day. And uh, this is also varying with the, with the livelihood issues, health matters. For instance, one anthropologist has written about menopausal women in, in, in Japan, where like, sex is, is the last thing on their mind. Like, okay, so I have to work, I have to to meet my everyday needs, and and uh, and then there is this health issue. So when you foreground uh, matters of sexuality, uh, you are out of place. So I'm glad we have uh, this clear spelled out. Like we have everyday life, and this is what I'm going to talk about. And we have future life or or current debates, which you are interested in. But I think we should. I try to to come like. Plot it as a continuum. Can we can we plot can we plot the future into the everyday? Like this is quite hard. I'm trying to do it, and and uh, I want to hear if you have if you have tried to do this kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, so I was in a meeting once in which there was a debate in Kenya. Uh, in a former part of my life, we do all this training to prepare women parliamentarians. So this was the conversation I was in. And as is the case, the debate around uh, homosexuality came up for, for some reason or other. This was um, well before 2016 in Mombasa in Kenya. And um, the person who was facilitating the session, she was just a facilitator, the debate came from the floor, was, was pregnant. This matters to what I'm about to say. And the debate happened in which they said, but uh, we've always had these things in our societies. I don't care what you do in the bedroom, right? Uh, that is not what matters in the conversation. Keep what you do in the bedroom, that's fine. What was interesting to me was that the facilitator who was pregnant, in the course of the day, several people congratulated them for the product that emerged from the proverbial bedroom that she was carrying, and her contribution to the world through uh, a child that we, I know was uh, given back to healthy and well, uh, and how that child then contributes to labor supply chains, education, further reproduction, and social reproduction. I use this example to make the point that when we say that something exists in the private domain, and that thing there, you, so long as you do it, I don't care. But when other things happen in the private public domain that look very much like those things, these ones are okay, right? So for me, who is pregnant, having a child, well done. Look at you. Yeah? You've made our family very happy. Is it a girl or a boy? Yeah? And even if it's a girl or a boy, depending on the family you come from, it is praised in specific ways. When you're not able to, to birth a child, carry a child in your womb as a woman, that is also a problem on occasion. Why? Because bringing child and bringing life into the world is important to the everyday, right? That child is part of the legacy of your family, your community, of the society. If you don't give birth, it is argued that you're not contributing to the society. If you give birth too much, if you follow this Maltesian debate, Africans are a problem. That's over reproducing. There's nothing they're doing. So what is the everyday, Grace? Right? What do we understand to be sexuality? 
I think the, the fact is that when people talk about sexuality, the assumption is that you're talking about sex. No. As I argued at the beginning, heterosexuality is not just an organizing framework for reproduction. It's an organizing framework for social reproduction. That's how unpaid labor is organized. That's how health systems are organized. Who has access and does not have access to good health care? And why not? Which women? Which men? The class dynamics that shape the everyday is rooted in how sexualities organize the economy, organize politics, organize culture, organize society. I think it is our desire to reduce the conversation to sex alone that creates the inability for us to say that sexualities are about the everyday. They are structuring our societies every single moment. From your choice to not have sex, from your choice to when you have that sex, and the impact of that moment, private or otherwise, by choice or not by choice, and if we're talking about violence here, your choices around reproductive technologies and how you choose to use those or not, is about the everyday. So I think this is an invitation to think about the field of sexualities as not being a conversation about sex, number one. But even if it is a conversation about sex, in a society that's deeply preoccupied with reproduction and the function that that has in organizing our societies, we then must also pay attention to it. Because it is also in the realm of the sex that violence to a great degree happens. Whether we're talking about our young girls with questions of teenage pregnancy, that's the everyday. When we're talking about uh, people who have access to good maternal, uh, you know, pre, pre uh, what is it called? I don't even have the language. Yeah. Antenatal care and, you know, postnatal care. Whether we talk about the debates that happen on, uh, uh, I, I read an article, a very interesting article once, uh, Pinky, in the Kenyan newspaper, where they were trying to lobby uh, men to get um, vasectomies as part of think sharing responsibility for, for managing and thinking about uh, uh, family planning. And there was an incentive. They were, I think they were giving them $500. I don't know how many of us or you in the room have been incentivized mm -hmm. to, to go and use uh, particular forms of reproductive technology on the one hand. For those of you who write about health and reproductive health, you know that doctors will tell you that at a certain age you cannot choose to have a tubal ligation. You can't as a woman because you're told you're still in your reproductive age. So the state is very involved in your womb on a day-to-day on a, on a, on a -day basis, right? Uh, the, those of you who use these reproductive technologies know some of the long-term effects they have on women's bodies and the risks that they pose. So this is really a deeply gendered conversation that impacts the everyday. But let me leave that there. And let me turn to the question of, uh, of, uh, of research agenda. And I want to frame this with, within the, the, the context of research funding and the research funding landscape. So in the UK where I'm based, there's been lots of conversations around decolonizing the research sphere, lots of interventions by well-meaning uh, European scholars uh, and, and researchers in terms of influencing and shaping large-scale research funding bodies. And we know that funding is also dwindling in terms of how we work with, with uh, colleagues based in Africa or in the Global South, how they set the research agenda so that it is not us who are sitting there designing the proposal. We invite you simply to add your name and then you become a, 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 a data collector. You're not necessarily involved in, in shaping the intellectual project. So there's a bit of work that has been done there which has really altered in significant ways how researchers and partners in the Global South, or in Africa in particular, are engaging with scholars in the Global North, including what percentages of money move and actually sit in the African continent and in African universities. In fact, for some funders, if you do not have a, a, a scholar or an academic from an African university, if Africa is your site of focus, as a PI, then your likelihood of getting that, uh, uh, that funding is greatly reduced. Now, of course, we know that it can be essentialized, right? You can simply be a name. And so there's, there's still an interrogation of the power dynamics that still continue to shape who drives and, and influences the research landscape. That's the one bit. bit. The second bit is another tension that we must resolve for ourselves. And, and here, this is a tension that I struggle with a lot. And I want to introduce it to how I think about PhD when people apply to do a PhD. I'm often intrigued by the number of proposals 
that come in around PhD projects that are around studying the impact of, that are around studying, uh, you know, all kinds of impacts of things, which then means you're applying theory, right? You're not necessarily viewing the empirical work you're doing as a basis of extending and expanding the field that you're intervening in. Uh, and that puts us sometimes on the, on the back foot, right? And, and so my task often when I'm doing PhD supervision is to push, particularly my black and African students, don't really care about the others, around how is it that we are also defining and shaping the fields that we are working in. <coughs> I'm, an, I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm a person who does field work, who does qualitative research. So empirical work is very important to me. But that should not be the sphere around which we sit. And I'm arguing that because we have been pushed so much by the absence of funding, by funders dictating what it is that we are getting money for, we have also then presented ourselves that our work must only be about the impact of. Right? Rather than how does that impact of help us Think about these theories of labor and land. And how is that, how is my PhD or any of my research work therefore expanding the theoretical and conceptual contours of that particular discipline? I think on the third front on, on shaping the research agenda, because of the dwindling research funding landscape, is that I think that lots of philanthropic organizations now investing in academic research funding and because of the pressures associated with the debate on decolonizing philanthropy and decolonizing research that are quite interested and potentially even scared of defining a research agenda for you. Now the question is finding and targeting those particular philanthropic institutions who are much more interested in supporting for organizations your strategic agenda rather than a project and for researchers the mission of perhaps the, 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 the center or the school or the sort of the mission. But they will only support what you brought. So if you brought the impact of, that is what they're going to support, right? But if you're bringing something that talks about the impact of and something much more expansive, we then also begin to set the agenda both in terms of discourse, in terms of scholarship, and in terms of broader ap approaches to this kind of work. Finally, on the point about the, the masculinities and, and, and Kenya and uh, the Kenyan diaspora, I'm really the worst person to ask about the Kenyan diaspora. Uh, uh, really the worst person to ask about that. But how might I approach this conversation on masculinities, in Kenya specifically? Some of the work that has intrigued me the most is scholars who write and think about informal settlements across Kenya. And what the role of policing, surveillance of communities on the margins of our urban cities does to reproduce the kinds of violence that Pinky was talking about and to produce particular images and conceptions of masculinity. That's a class debate, right? That's a gender and class debate. And that, that scholarship, for me, has been quite useful in, in expanding how we think about the, the close intersections between violence, masculinities, that are generated and sustained by surveillance, policing architectures and infrastructures across our urban landscape. Um, the, the field, I think, of masculinity is expanding rapidly, uh, even on the African continent. Copano Rateles and others, you know, are, are, are you know, sort of building an entire uh, uh, set of inter- and transdisciplinary scholarship that sits at the intersection of psychology, thinking around questions of, uh, you know, so sociology and phenomenology as sort of entry points to, to understanding that. So that's 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 how I respond to the question of masculinity. Thank you, Irina. Did you want to add anything else? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I won't be um, long. I think um, <laughs> Irina has covered uh, the questions that were directed to her mainly. But I do want to interface with the question of the everyday because I, keep, I, th I do think there is a lot of worry about whether we are talking in a way that empowers us to deal with the question of every day. I think even yesterday it came up. I think that we we have it can it, it can be addressed in two ways. The first one is the language. And and some speakers have already said that it's not just about translating the language into one that is being spoken there, but it is also the academic language. But I want to move away from whether the language is academic or not, 
to saying that once you interface with the space of, part of particularity, the space of here in this particular society, community, how we view homosexuality or whatever the debates that are here, that have a real bearing on people being beaten up and things like that. You, you, you are able to find the language of the values there. In other words, I'm saying that whereas we might be talking about epistemic rupture that combines all of us and whatnot, we actually are also able to find and converse the, with spaces on the basis of their values on Ubuntu and say it's not about rights if the debate is about rights. In South Africa, the notion of rights is both loved and not loved because there are people who begrudge it as, as being a barrier of conversation. And things are going wrong because the youth is taught so much about rights. But if you say Ubuntu, and, and do you think that the this, this subject or the manner in which in this community you're handling questions around sexuality, um, other than knowing more about it, do you think that it aligns with Ubuntu to beat up and burn someone because they are um, queer? And, 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 and you, you do find this cause that is local. That is why I'm, I'm sort of like leaning towards saying, depending on how Cordesia wants to stretch it, there could be lobby points directed at formality and the formal space and policy. There could be lobby points directed at examples of, and of, of how to converse locally in proper ways that translate the values that we are pining for here into the local space. And, and the, the, the one last thing I wanted to say is, is that society and social life never stopped evolving because we were quibbling with each other colonially. People were going to evolve. It's not only acculturation. Um, when you're talking about being a Sangoma, and there are so many varied ways in which there's been an evolution of tra traditional leadership, whether it imbibes symbols that are new, um, that combines Zionism and, and Sangomaship, or, or all of those kinds of things, in ways that continue to create a conversation. So I think that the way forward, especially in relation to the question of, um, of, of real life, of everyday life, is to immerse ourselves, as, as proper socio uh, anthropologists would say. Thank you, <laughs> proper. Thank you Um, thank you so much. Um, and I, I mean, in terms of what the everyday is and how we encounter, I mean, I'm thinking also what you said. I was thinking as we were sitting here, in terms of how we organize in a feminist way, also because Jean is here, one of the strongest feminist organizers know how we function formally in ceremonial space. I was like, this is a reenactment of Osman Sembele's Hala, which I think is. Yeah, I've never seen it to tell the story. You know, at the post colonial moment, the Chamber of Commerce and the function from which, or the formalism of how we engage, if we were to engage in a feminist way, what does it mean to point to overt and not overt forms of hierarchy and how they structure a general impotence that is at the heart of the very performance in and of itself. And I think it also then meets the comment you made about metrics and citations. I did this kind of running through the most cited African feminist scholars and how they are cited. And often it's, not, it's, it's like mythology. It's like the person was never read. And, and there's a profound anti-intellectualism that is also at the heart of what is being called a debate and not debate. I've seen it even in postgraduate courses. We have our, open, our postgraduates' main courses on critical approaches, critical debates. And you know, the language question will come up and the, you know, the conference in this place. And so there's a lot of descriptives of particular moments of a debate. But I'm reading the material, and there's no sense that the person read Ngubi himself. And I'm like, so it's like mythology. You know, even at the level of postgraduate, in terms of what a debate gets constructed as, as it travels. And then it gets further when I do now the section on feminine, African feminist criticism, where I get to create, and, and the person is now not even read the material, or at least feigning to, 
there's no need to then mythologize a person as the figure. Now, even Mugi is now the, perf the, the expert in this field. How did we get there? So there's a dissociation to refuse to even engage it, and then because now it's ideological and not intellectual. And so those things operate because what happens with these citations is that it's the empirical example that is referenced. Sylvia Tamale writes about this. The text is not engaged. And I think since our job is to be intellectuals, it's a profound gap that does demonstrate to me a fear. What the Hala is, is the fear of the real knowledge of an impotence itself. And what it generates is a, so, so many dissociations, you know, whether it's like you, people are journaling, doing shadow work because the threat of thinking is too much, because the conditions of the everyday are so precarious that that has to be directly addressed as immediate and it's urgent. Um, and oh, now I'm like, I forget there was a, my brain stopped. Um, oh, are we know about meaning making and why start with storytelling um, and hard and soft science, which again is also another highly impotent story, right? Is, is of course what I understand as black intellectual traditions and histories because that is my training primarily, whether I, sometimes I'm teaching in physics, sometimes I'm teaching, because that is the, is that there's something about theory itself in terms of how we travel and meaning making, where storytelling functions can be archeological, it's genealogical, the object and subject are not pulled apart. So, you know, what you're saying about the empirical, but it seems to me as part of this, and I think that, again, what is the university's role, research institution's role in supporting a failing post-colonial nation state, as Hala demonstrates, when the anti-intellectualism of it insists upon a separation of theory and the empirical that is intentional in its affect of fear. It is intentional in, in structuring an affect of fear. What does that do in terms of what you then say, are we known to say, how do you make it meaningful? Um, what are the la language options to make scholarship meaningful so that it actually has the effect to do if we so claim that the intention of our classroom is justice? Why is it so intentional to, to make no sense at all? People are writing myths, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I want, I want to appreciate Awino for the wonderful presentation and for bringing forward the debates because, um, I mean, you have talked about the different debates and how they are evolving and how this should be a concern to us. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering that um, as Codestria, do you consider the global economy, the macroeconomics, I think you mentioned it in, in passing, the, how the macroeconomics affect the microeconomics or the smart economics, and how this actually might affect the everyday life that uh, somebody was talking about. Is this also part of the discourse or part of the debates that we should be concerned with as we talk about feminism? Um, America being um, the head boy of, of, or head prefect of, uh, of human rights and, and uh, recently they are threatening sanctions. Uh, why don't they ever put sanctions on the human rights abuses that we have been seeing, in, for example, in our country, on the streets everywhere? Why don't they ever put sanctions on that? Why don't they ever put sanctions on countries that are poor? I mean, poverty is a human rights violation. Why don't we put sanctions on countries for being poor? Or is it because they are actually the cause of this poverty? So is this part of engagement and discourse that feminists should be uh, concerned with or should be part of it? Because I, I don't think, I mean, you just mentioned probably in passing, in, and, and I'm, I'm just wondering whether Codestria thinks that this is an important aspect that we could actually engage with and how uh, the macroeconomics is a huge problem is a huge evil, actually, to human beings. Thank you. I take one more and then give a chance to Irina to respond. Yes, please, yourself. These people who are behind me made me think that you were picking me all the time. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, 
Last night I was reflecting on the treadmill and you know how you are in one place but you are actually working and uh, most probably first of all maybe you are lazy but also maybe you don't have opportunities to walk beyond uh, that treadmill and within that I've seen now the role of the invisible hand and fear. Uh, why am I taking that long route? I'm looking at most of our intellectuals, okay, in our situation, uh, based in public universities, like ourselves, and looking at how the normalization of patriarchal authoritarianism has actually permeated uh, our, our public universities. And it's not just about feminist studies, it's about almost everything. But of course, for us, as we push through uh, that sort of uh, big force and backlash, uh, there is that big role that we need to play. So the, the lazy approach that we take cannot actually allow us to ask questions uh, that you've put on the table. The context unless you're really very fearful, cannot allow you to address, to, to raise those issues, even in the lecture room, because there is a, a, a constant fear around you, and of course also uh, what Dr. Msiment has talked about in terms of uh, the, the context and the need to survive and so on, and the fact that then uh, what comes out is uh, a sort of scholarship that is predicated on a few rhymes. So a few rhymes, women, the development and this. So even if you go through seven weeks of training, you're going to come up with that. I attended I, uh, one uh, institute as um, I was supposed to be director, but I didn't have the time, so I came in as one of the, of the uh, resource persons. And the first week we were fine, and as, as you mentioned, the second week you have all these stereotypes coming up, and you wonder what is it that people are doing with these resources that, that they are being exposed to. And, and, and the fact that I think the intellectual rigor and the intellectual practice does not allow us to actually move to those fundamental questions. What will it take for us to actually move uh, beyond uh, these, these rhymes, uh, to, to, to take on the, the, the fundamentals and, and you know, realize also that you know, most of the social forces, you know, labor movements and so on, have been depoliticized. And you don't have those um, sort of forces that, that would actually feed into a, a kind of strong uh, feminist movement. Uh, in Uganda, for example, f for people who really name themselves feminists, are actually ostracized. Uh, one of the organizations, uh, Akinamama Africa, who, which says openly we are a feminist organization, that already is actually a crisis and a cause of fear. So I'm, I'm wondering how these things around us, the, the context around us, can allow us to, to go beyond, and, and especially when we are talking about uh, the next generation of scholars, what are the resources, I'm not talking about material resources, I'm talking about those ideological, theoretical, conceptual resources that can allow us uh, to raise the questions that you're raising, as a practice, not just in a, in a one setting, but as a practice, everyday practice, in the lecture room, in parliament, in um, our everyday life and so on. Thank you very much. Just two closing points, and I want to take off from where you stopped, uh, Justin. Um, and those who have lived longer than me and have worked in universities, I think will recognize the sort of resurgent conversations around academic freedom and how those have ebbed and flowed over time particularly in public universities, how that 
also led in some kinds of ways to the proliferation of private universities and the impact that has to equitable access to education. The debate on academic freedom are also raging, uh, as I mentioned, in, in the US, whether that is occurring through the conversations on critical race theory or in the UK, where that is happening through the idea of uh, ensuring that universities are open spaces for debates um, uh, around specific issues. So it's being animated around questions of trans uh, and amongst other kinds of, of, uh, of debates. I, I would be um, I would be insensitive and I would be lying if I did not say that these are difficult issues to navigate when you're working in a context in which you cannot rely on your institution to protect your academic freedom. So I work in an institution where I know that when I say certain things in the classroom, and it's backed by intellectual academic evidence, uh, so I'm not just pulling things from the air. Even if a student went to lay a complaint against me, which students often do, you know, for various things, whether it's around Palestine, or whether it's around other, other issues that other academics work on at source, the university will protect them because it, protect, it, it, uh, it protects academic freedom and it protects the right of academics to write, to research, and engage on the matters that um, matter to them and matter to the world more broadly. So that, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I think, you know, it's particularly public universities where the state, the political elite, the ruling regime, has such a strong uh, impact on, on scholarship, shaping the research agenda even of universities. We see this in places like Ethiopia as well. It's a complex one. I think there is something, and I can't tell you to be brave, right? Food has to be put on the table. Children have to be taken to school. Uh, you know, homes have to be built. Elderly parents have to be taken care of. The complex sets of demands that are, are, are placed on each of us. Now, one could think about the possibilities of insurgent scholarship or spaces that would allow for this kind of critical uh, scholarship to emerge, and Podestia can provide that kind of container. So that's the one thing. The second thing, Godwin, is, is linked to this question of academic freedom, and we have had this discussion before, about the state of our higher education, uh, our state of our institutions in, in, in Africa. We've had it through the debate on research methodology. But I'm wondering whether there's a moment for Kodosia to convene a number of our African VCs and, and have an open debate around some of these issues uh, and see where that leads us. Um, and that could be an African-centered conversation in its first iteration and a transnational conversation in its next iteration as a way to begin to unpack some of these questions broadly around academic freedom. Thank you so much for the privilege of, uh, of giving this keynote and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, both uh, Chair. You didn't eventually leave me the, the one minute, uh, <laughs> if you noticed. Uh, but just a very quick uh, point. I think that uh, Kodesria got really interested in academic freedom, and we lost that interest at some point. And uh, it's time uh, to go back. And uh, indeed, we're trying to do uh, two pilot engagements, one in, uh, in uh, Mozambique, the other one in Tanzania in order to reactivate uh, the networks that uh, pushed us into that dialogue in the first place. And so we, we're coming back. And one of the things that I've been doing in the last one and a half years has been to uh, roll myself into specific universities, get the attention of vice chancellors, and then make the point that we need to bring you into this conversation, uh, because it can't go on without you. Uh, the truth of the matter that uh, when you are in some of our African universities, the, it quickly dawns on you that uh, you have greater freedom of speech outside the university than you do within the university, uh, which means that something is happening in our societies that is a lot more uh, transformative than, it, than is happening in the university. And so the question has eventually to come back to <laughs> these institutions, what's the kind of associational life that we have promoted within the university, and what does that mean uh, for our capacity to teach, research, and produce knowledge? So you have placed uh, an important agenda on our table, and academic freedom uh, is going to be a part, a central part of the work we're going to do in the next five years, hopefully beyond uh, this. And I feel that Codesvia has uh, ceded too much terrain, and everybody's doing a whole number of things 
but the conceptual and methodological thinking that needs to go into framing this discussion, I think, is getting lost, especially for, for Africa. So uh, just to respond to that particular question. In the, in the new strategic plan, uh, are we going to have uh, as a core thematic area for the next five years uh, a theme we are calling transformations in African economies. And the overall chapeau uh, of this particular uh, uh, discussion is going to be a discussion of transitions and transformations. Uh, because we also feel that we've done quite a bit of reform, reform, reform. Everywhere we've been reforming, uh, but haven't given nearly enough space for transformation. Uh, so even if transformation isn't happening uh, in society in the manner in which we, we want, can we lead the discussion around the potential for transformation is something that we're placing on the table. So the question about um, uh, the macro and micro and the relationship between with that is, and a gendered analysis, uh, pushing the boundaries in a, in a really strong feminist direction should inform uh, how we're going to be engaging uh, this. So the first really major meeting meetings we've had uh, uh, post the, the, the two-year audit that we went through in Codestria has really focused, first of all, can we begin with these discussions around the feminist and gender question before we go to the governance and all those other things. And our desire is to find an expression of what we're discussing here into those meetings so we don't uh, lose uh, touch with uh, what is more fundamental uh, to us. And I, one of the hidden me reasons why we are here is that I want to carry not just a message, but I want to carry a number of people into the other conversations that we're going to have uh, going forward. So um, uh, we're not leaving uh, this behind and we're not leaving uh, a whole range of other things behind. We have four thematic areas and I think they speak to many of the issues that we're discussing here. I am aware that I'm standing between you and the tea, so let me shut up and uh, welcome you uh, to tea break. Uh, we're going to do that for roughly uh, 20 minutes. I will close those 20 minutes back from one of the panels, but I will only surprise them when I invite them to speak on why I close those minutes from them. So 20 minutes and then we come back. I'm assuming this is our tea, so let's just read it. <laughs> Look forward to us having a great conversation. So this after break, we are supposed to dip into what someone already raised, um, feminist economics, which is an important part of um, the feminist agenda currently. As I thought about this panel, I could not help but think about the time we had the structural adjustment programs. My parents were civil servants and I saw through their experience and the experience of those that they worked with when the structural adjustment programs were forced upon us by those two Bretton Woods um, institutions. I won't mention their names because they, they, they are traumatic in nature. And just even by mentioning their name, you begin to think um, the trauma comes on. So I recall very vividly, even as a young woman, seeing um, our neighbors leave the public service and return to their, to their villages, their children leave the schools that we used to attend because someone sat somewhere and came up with a plan of austerity uh, and cutting back on government. And the effects are still with us, and we are still um, walking that same path that we walked then. I guess the mantra that says that the more things change, the more they remain the same. At this moment, um, I wanted to also say, I thought about the moment when I joined civil society. One of the things that we worked on was on debt. And right now we know several African countries, um, some countries are in worse crisis, but we all know that we are headed there. And so again, the more things change, the more they remain the same. So we are at the same inflection point that we were in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, 
we are right at that same inflection point. And I know that Dr. Godwin talked about we have done enough reforms and not enough transformation. But I do hope that the conversation we're going to have today is going to be able to ask us ourselves in the room what needs to change. Um, Dr. Sylvia Tamale in her book, Decolonization and Afrofeminism, talks about the hamster wheel. You're believing that you're working towards something, but you're just rotating around that wheel and not really reaching anywhere. And that can be extremely frustrating. So I hope that we are at that moment in time as Africans, as feminists, as social justice actors, where we truly would want to move away from speaking for the sake of speaking, but to that point where we want to actually see that we are transforming um, our economies and ultimately our societies. As an organization, Akina Mama, we have a thematic area on macroeconomic justice. And while we are trying as much as possible to infuse in feminist approaches, it's still very much a big boys club. And so we are also learning how to navigate the space, the language, the politics, and really what is going to create that transformation that we need to see. And therefore, I'm going to invite our first panelist, Sheila, who is going to take us through centering feminist economics for a more just Africa in a post-pandemic world. I know that Dr. Sylvia Tamale convened Feminist Africa last week, and a similar conversation was had on this topic. Very rich and very enlightening. It's online, um, so it's something that we can begin to see how scholars bring all this knowledge um, together. So without much ado, uh, Sheila, you're welcome to wow us. Um, I have learned that academics speak on podiums. I'd hope to have a panel and sit here and interact together and make it more conversational, but I'm, I'm fitting within this structure. <laughs> I'm excited um, to be with you here to engage on such a, an important topic. And I'd like to take uh, advantage of the floor to really thank Odisha formally for this meeting and for having me together with you to share views and experiences and ideas uh, and the way forward for Odisha. Because as I mentioned yesterday, uh, once Odisha, always Odisha. So I'm part of the Kodistria family with all the intentionality of consolidating the institution. Uh, well, as you would have seen from the program, uh, the title of my paper is Centering Feminist Economics for a More Just Africa in a Post-Pandemic World. Let me start by a couple of definitions. Uh, African feminist economics. Uh, what does that mean? Very broadly, feminist economics refers to the study of economic societies and economic structures, as well as the study of the discipline itself, with a special focus on gender analysis and gender sensitive analysis in all spheres and controls of the economy. A post pandemic world is also very difficult to define because it depends on where you're sitting at. Some people will say, why are we talking about a post-pandemic world? The pandemic is still with us. Others will say, well, we've got out of it and therefore we can probably think of the aftermath of the pandemic. But what I want to choose to sort of especially focus on when I'm talking about post-pandemic world is the everyday, what you were mentioning, the living experiences of people within the context of the pandemic, particularly women, as we seek to build back better, if we can use the term build back better, because I don't know whether we're still building back or whether we can build back better in the aftermath of COVID-19. Questions worth posing in this context are, is the COVID pandemic really behind us? Do we now know the exact origins of the pandemic? And what are the risks of other such pandemics occurring and breaking out in everywhere and on the continent are key to the thinking that we are going to try and evolve in the next few minutes. Um, 
The reason why I ask this particular question, whether there is a risk of other such pandemics happening, is also linked to the argument that I will try to make in the paper later on, is that when we look at our models of development and the kinds of development that we are embracing, we are very often, very often, we are destroying the nature. And the pandemic is known to be a zoonotic disease, where destruction of our nature, forest, waterways, biodiversity, and everything else is also coming into the fore and contributing to the emergence of such pandemics. And this is something that we do, that some people do in the name of development, because to them, there is no nuance, there is no distinction. Development is all about the market logic, profit maximization, even though nature is being destroyed in very big ways on, on the continent. The argument that I therefore advance in this paper is that it has become more urgent than ever before to understand the multi-layered significance of feminist economics and give the latter its rightful place in the intellectual and policy space within Africa so that the chances for achieving gender equality, particularly for African women's empowerment, and restore back their dignity and full humanity. It is a question of human rights after all. A second strand of thinking in this paper is that there can be no effective transformation. We've heard the word transformation. We've even been told that there is a program on transformation that Kodisha is proposing to engage in in the next few years. But uh, I'm arguing that if uh, there, can, there can be no effective transformation and improvement in the African human condition, if we do not intentionally, a word that we've been hearing since day one, since yesterday, the intentionality behind it, if we do not intentionally and rapidly consolidate and expand the African feminist economist pool, both men and women who can contribute to dismantle, if we consolidate that pool, who can, who can contribute to dismantle patriarchy, capitalism, and the new world globalization that we are going through. As uh, the chair of this particular panel just said, Junis just said, we're still living with the consequences of structural adjustment and neoliberal globalization with all its deleterious impacts on women, particularly women and children. Um, this pool that I'm talking about, this um, necessity of consolidating, developing and expanding a pool of feminist economists is also very important because it may help us to try and jettison the idea that growth equates development a mantra that we've heard far too often, and I want to challenge this idea that growth is not development. Growth is necessary for development, but growth is not development, and I embrace, and I embrace the ideas of Amartya Sen, where development is about freedom, freedom from disease, freedom from illness, freedom from illiteracy, freedom from homelessness, all the freedoms that we badly want as we struggle for our livelihoods on this continent in particular. A third and final strand of thinking in this paper is that not only do we need more feminist economists, but we need them as policy makers and legislators so that governance itself becomes more gender aware and gender sensitive, thus enhancing our ability to embrace alternative development paradigms where the economy of care and protection of our planetary boundaries are or become the norm. Now that I've established these three strands of thinking, I want to actually take you through the paper, which I've distilled from the main paper, just a few quick points. While attention on the necessity of interrogating the gender blindness of the economics as a discipline started way back in the early 90s, largely to the credit of Kodestria, and a few African feminists within certain academic circles and organizations. And while such circles have grown and expanded, translating the thinking into appropriate and relevant policies continue to remain marginal and insufficiently centered. In his chapter to the edited, the seminal work on engineering social sciences, Guy Mahone aptly notes, I quote, Economics as a discipline has indeed scientifically succeeded in explaining 
predicting and controlling an economic reality that is male-dominated. And as such, it has been not only an outcome, but an instrument of male domination. Close. Other chapters, other chapters in the same volume by Dan Nelson, Abel Hutchful, have all sort of uh, enriched the debates, but more than three decades have passed since these scholars have drawn our attention to the pertinence of women's unpaid work, the care economy, their reproductive roles, and the triple burdens and how these have sustained capitalism, patriarchy, and neoliberal globalization alluded to earlier. It is perhaps legitimate to ask what has all the knowledge produced led to? Could it, and could it have followed some subsequently in terms of the output of knowledge produced through the Codestria Gender Institutes as well as the other African scholarly spaces could it have contributed to prevent what feminist economist uh, Alexandra Mezadri calls a pandemic-induced uh, crisis of social reproduction? Commenting on the pandemic, Pereira and uh, Sicata argue, I quote, for the African continent, COVID-19 is yet one more crisis to add to the existing string of disasters. And these disasters include climate change, the climate crisis, uh, uh, land grabs, hunger, increasing violence, rising poverty, and unemployment. So why is it important and urgent, more than ever before, to center fem feminist economics in development debates, both locally and at the global level? I have a few reasons for this. The first is that this multiplicity of crises, mutually reinforcing and overlapping, are actually impact impacting in a more than disproportionate manner on women and children on the continent. A second reason is that the time it is said that it will take to achieve gender equality just gives you the shivers. You get worried and concerned. UN Women says that it will take 300 years to achieve gender equality, and the World Economic Forum tells us that it will take 138 years. And in between there, there are so many risks of everything going wrong. So you can imagine what will be the outcome of these kinds of situations particularly at a time that we have entered the Anthropocene age with the ever continuous destruction of nature. A third reason is that uh, there is increasing evidence that progress made on SDG gender five, SDG five gender equality is regressing. Uh, a lot of research has been done in the area and impacts of COVID and we can see that this is really going down. The World Population Review 2022 notes that nine of out of 10 poorest countries in the world are in Africa, whilst the UNDP Women COVID-19 Global Gender Response Tracker points out that only 20, 32% of the 842 social protection and labor market measures adopted by African governments are actually gender sensitive. The AU Agenda 2063, I think somebody was talking about the labeling, the use of the word feminist, or, non, or not the use of the word feminist. But it struck me that the AU Agenda 2063, and with the AU having a number of uh, women heading different departments, does not a single time use the word feminist in the AU Agenda 2063, although all the aspirations that we're talking about are referring to the idea of empowering women. In fact, uh, at paragraph 50, the document states that African women will be fully empowered in all spheres with equal social, political, and economic rights. But what is unfolding in front of us seems to be weighing heavily against these rights. Another reason will be the many international conferences that we've had, the Beijing-Mexico conference, and all the Africa protocols, the SADC protocol, all these may start losing significance if we do not do anything about it and if we do not intervene in the macroeconomic thinking and where is Africa placed as a continent in this current global system. Um, it is also important perhaps at this juncture to mention that another reason that is of concern and that should be of concern to us as we talk through the thinking of feminist economics is the rapidly shifting geostrategic relations in the multipolar world. And what does that mean for Africa? And where are we as a continent within this context? Uh, 
who are we aligning with and uh, what are the consequences of the new alignments uh, that Africa has. And we must not forget that when we talk about Africa, Africa is diverse. Africa is not a monolithic, homogeneous block. The choices of policies depend on the kinds of leaders that we have and their own perspectives and views of, um, of the world. There is a fair bit of research looking at the impacts of COVID-19 in Africa, and I'm not going to delve on these, but suffice it to say that the pandemic has laid bare the different forms of persistent structural inequalities that exist in our economies on the continent, and has also highlighted the, inade the inadequacy of measures adopted in addressing gender inequality. In a very well-documented paper, Kinoti and Kelleher sums this very well. They note, while there have been some laudable policy efforts to address the consequences of the pandemic across the continent, they have only been largely gender blind, but have, they have not only been largely gender blind, but they have also deepened gender inequalities. Now, when we look at the string of initiatives that have taken place on the continent by different groups, different scholars, different people who've been commissioned studies, etc., starting with the Lagos Plan of Action, the Africa's Priority Program for Economic Recovery, the African Alternative Framework to Structural Adjustment Programs for Socioeconomic Recovery and Transformation, NEPAD, uh, to mention just a few. When we look at these, there is very little, if at all, in terms of feminist economic thinking or even gender sensitivity to the issues that we are wanting to address at this particular juncture. And yet they all emerged after we've all witnessed the consequences, the deleterious impacts of the structural adjustment programs. One would have thought and legitimately expected that our thinkers, our strategists would have taken that into consideration, but uh, there was very little of that. Um, and uh, very little which um, highlights the vagary, the, what I call the vagaries of intersectional feminism. One would have expected that with the scholarly outputs, the feminist scholarship that has emerged, although still very little to my mind, uh, would have had helped some of the thinkers uh, to sort of bring some of the issues uh, to the table. But that, has, um, that leaves a lot to be desired from that perspective. However, it is um, uh, rather comforting to know that the group of African feminists, uh, um, that there is a group of Af African feminists who mobilized and drafted a letter, a statement known as the African Feminist Post-COVID-19 COVID Economic Recovery, Recovery Statement, which they sent to the special envoys appointed by the African Union mandated to mobilize international support to address the coronavirus pandemic in Africa and to engage in the development debates. It must be noted that only one of these special envoys is a woman in the name of Dr. Gozi Okonyo Iweka. This group of African feminists start their letter by stating that, I quote, we are a constellation of African feminists who are steeped in Pan-African vision for a liberated Africa. And they go on to make some most pertinent recommendations within a spirit and a framework of reimagining Africa. And I want here to borrow the term that was used by Professor Tamali yesterday to try and promote Ubuntu in the reimaginings of the new Africa after the COVID-19. Now, Having this as a backdrop and thinking of the context in which we are operating, it leads me to a few interrogations. And the questions that I have is, one, would this collective of uh, articulate and well-informed feminist economists, feminist voices, be sufficient to change Africa's position in the current global uncertain, volatile and ambiguous environment in the multipolar world that we are living in? Would that be enough? Two, are our universities and institutions of higher learning doing enough to promote a feminist consciousness so vital for a better and more inclusive world and a more inclusive Africa? Third, is there scope for Kudisria 
to perhaps carry out what we were talking about as an audit, but not only of the Gender Institute's laureates, I'll go beyond that, to carry out an audit and a study of the business and economic departments and faculties to gauge the extent to which the discipline allows for the centering of feminist economics for Africa. Uh, to my mind, this is extremely crucial, and uh, I'll share something with you. The reason why I say it's crucial, I come from a small island state. I come from <coughs> Mauritius. I've been at the University of Mauritius for many years. Gender studies and women's studies have closed down there because of lack of resources, they argue. The economics faculty, which used to be in uh, the Faculty of Social Studies and Humanities, it's still there, but it doesn't do any of what um, um, uh, uh, Arena was talking about, uh, that you, at, 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 uh, in London, at SOAS, they tell you that, well, this course is heter heterodox economics. We don't hear that. It's, um, you know, alien to talk about heterodox economics in certain spaces because the model of development that is being embraced by that small island state and many other places too is a neoliberal model. We only want to hear about financial issues, you know, financial management, the business world and the market, the unfettered market and what it is doing to our spaces. And five, um, it's also, yeah, I think this is extremely important. I've been looking at some of the works that the Gender Institutes have produced, the publications, and I'm beginning to think that although there has been so much of rich work that has been done on different sub-themes, you know, the care economy, uh, gender in trade, gender in families, sexuality, etc., isn't it time for Codistria to revisit the works done on the various thematics for the gender institutes particularly the earlier ones, and bring them in a holistic manner, taking into consideration new initiatives and developments, such as the Africa Free Trade Continental Area. What does that mean for women? Are our women informal workers getting a chance to be able to benefit from the African Free Trade Continental Area? What does that mean for the SMEs, which are known to be embracing more women in certain parts of Africa? Perhaps it is uh, time for Kodisria to build stronger, that's another point that I'd like to probably more or less uh, close on, perhaps it is time for us at Kodisria to build stronger pathways and bridges with the actual policy makers and practitioners, particularly those within the gender, the planning department and the finance ministries on the continent I remember, God, when you said that Kodesia has started gender budgeting, but I think our countries themselves need not only to pay lip service to gender budgeting, but really understand the different multiple forms and the implications of gender budgeting if we want to get women at par with men and allow for some forms of development to take place. Um, allow me to then conclude by saying that the pandemic represents an opportune moment for us not only to rethink the African political economy from a feminist perspective, but to act, to make our voices heard, to build networks and transnational alliances, and to work in solidarity for a more just Africa. The mutually reinforcing and uh, overlapping crises that I referred to earlier on and the financial crisis of 2008 itself are stark reminders that unfettered markets cannot be the determinants of wealth, of economic distribution and well-being of our citizens. So what I want to propose is for us as feminist economists to work for an alternative development paradigm which embraces uh, eco-feminist ideas and values. Not only feminist, but the environment is extremely important. The ecology for us in Africa, because of the kinds of models of development, it's a, it's a point that I really want to stress because it seems to me that it is not sufficiently um, mainstreamed within the debates. I think it is left to ecologists and environmentalists and not sufficiently brought in with the feminist economists. Uh, so I think we need to pay more attention to that.
so that we can be sure that in the years to come, this feminist economics and the feminist consciousness and the feminist scholarship that we are talking about since yesterday, it's not only going to be within our books, within our research papers and within our academia, but it can actually be used to transform and to make a difference to the human condition on the continent. Let me end by a note, that, um, a personal note, that I have been so fed up with academia sitting in the ivory tower of the University of Mauritius that I decided to leave my professorial comfort zone to join the world of politics, to be able to try and make the feminist voices heard and embrace the neoliberal and, and uh, jettison the neoliberal paradigms and embrace alternative visions of development. Thank you. Thank you for grounding us in, 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 in centering feminist economics um, and reminding us that development is freedom um, and not merely the growth statistics that we've been seeing thrown around. I recall that one of the things that informed the Africa Rising um, mantra was mainly because of the double-digit economic growth rates we were seeing. But when you see countries like um, Ethiopia, that were developing at 13% in terms of growth, and now uh, because of the war and everything that's going on, they are in total shambles. But then also, oftentimes we are reminded about autocratic states like Rwanda that seem to be moving in a positive manner, but when they, there's no freedom. So thank you for that um, reminder. So I'm now going to invite our second panelist, who is going to help us give us a local perspective to this topic on feminist economics? You're welcome. Donc, euh, je disais que je remerciais infiniment le Codesria qui m'a invité à cette importante activité. Je dois vous avouer que lorsque j'ai reçu un message WhatsApp euh, qui venait de Dominique, euh, j'ai vu un indicateur d'un pays, je me suis dit ça, ça ressemble au Sénégal. Euh, je ne vais surtout pas répondre à ce message WhatsApp, euh, ça peut être des, des trackers, donc je, je ne réponds pas. Et puis, euh, elle me disait, il faut lire votre mail. Et d'ailleurs, l'adresse email était une adresse que j'utilise très peu. Mais bon, heureusement, je suis allée sur cette adresse email et j'ai vu euh, le message. Et, euh, et donc, j'ai répondu et, et me voici ici. Je voudrais infiniment remercier Sheila qui a posé les fondements théoriques de l'économie féministe, donc elle me rend la tâche facile. Moi, je suis quelqu'un du terrain, donc je veux vous amener au niveau local sur le terrain. Je dois dire que j'étais jeune étudiante à l'Institut international des relations internationales du Cameroun. Je préparais une thèse sur femmes et conflits armés lorsque j'ai été lauréate de l'Institut, c'était le premier institut et d'été sur le genre. On est alors en 1997, il y a 26 ans. Et euh, la personne ressource qui animait l'institut, c'est le professeur Pendambo ici présent. Et je voudrais vraiment lui dire merci parce qu'elle a tracé la voie et j'ai suivi cette voie jusqu'à aujourd'hui. Alors, je me suis euh, définitivement inscrite dans la dynamique de promotion de l'égalité homme-femme dans tous les parcours professionnels qui ont été les miens, euh, en tant que chercheur, euh, je ne suis pas une enseignante d'université, mais je suis une enseignante associée à un ensemble, euh, soit à l'université catholique, mais également à l'école internationale des forces de sécurité, où euh, je fais l'approche genre dans la consolidation de la paix. Et euh, en tant que euh, professionnel dans l'action humanitaire, je travaillais au comité international de la Croix-Rouge, j'ai travaillé naturellement, je suis diplomate au ministère des Relations extérieures, je travaille au ministère des Affaires sociales, et maintenant je fais le développement local, on dit que je fais la transhumance administrative. Anyway. Donc, à chaque fois, la question de la promotion de l'égalité homme-femme m'a poursuivi. Arrivé au ministère de la décentralisation et du développement local, je crois que mon ministre a regardé mon parcours, et il m'a désigné pour un focal genre. Et j'ai dit, ouf je ne vais pas me taper les festivités, parce que malheureusement, il faut les appeler comme ça, les festivités du 8 mars. Je suis allée le voir, 
Je lui ai dit, Monsieur le ministre, en tant que point focal genre, moi je m'engage à travailler à ce que notre département ministériel contribue à promouvoir l'égalité homme-femme dans le secteur de la décentralisation et du développement local. Au Cameroun, nous avons 10 régions comme collectivité territoriale décentralisée. Aucune femme n'est présidente de région. Nous avons 360 communes. Il n'y a que 39 femmes qui sont maires. On a 14 communautés urbaines, donc les grandes villes, les agglomérations. Aucune femme n'est maire de communauté urbaine, donc maire de la ville. J'ai dit, je vais contribuer à cela. Il a acheté le, le, le programme et, euh, et lorsque je dis cela, je me reviens au débat de tout à l'heure. Il a acheté le programme, on a eu les appuis de d'ONU Femmes, euh, de la GIZ, pour élaborer une stratégie d'amélioration de l'égalité homme-femme dans le secteur de la décentralisation et du développement local au Cameroun. Jusque-là, tout allait bien, mais apparemment, on lui a dit « Ouh, vous allez très loin là, c'est un nouveau département ministériel ». Avant, la décentralisation était dans le ministère de l'Intérieur, qui, chez nous, est le ministère de l'administration territoriale. Et donc, on a créé ce département ministériel en 2018. On lui a dit, de sa très haute hiérarchie, « Vous allez trop vite, il y a beaucoup d'innovation dans votre département ministériel, monsieur le ministre. » Il m'a dit, madame le directeur, « J'espère qu'il n'y a pas un agenda caché dans votre promotion de l'égalité homme-femme. » dans le secteur de la décentralisation et du développement local. Et encore une fois, ça pose le problème de la contextualisation. En tant que chercheur, dans un contexte, oui, disons le conservateur, en tant que chercheur ayant un poste de responsabilité dans un département ministériel qui a des règles, qui a des philosophies, comment on fait Moi, je vous pose la question, je n'ai pas de réponse. Pour venir euh, directement à, à, à ce qui nous intéresse ici, euh, je, je voudrais dire que dans le cadre de la réflexion en cours sur l'économie féministe, c'est là que vous avez euh, engagé, qui consiste, vous l'avez dit, à avoir un examen critique des dimensions de genre euh, dans la dynamique économique. Cet examen-là, comment est-ce qu'on analyse les rôles hommes-femmes euh, dans les, les dynamiques économiques Il m'a semblé important de se pencher sur la politique publique de la décentralisation parce que, L'objectif de la politique publique de la décentralisation, c'est d'améliorer les conditions de vie des populations à la base. C'est véritablement à côté de la démocratie euh, euh, au niveau local de développer les territoires et de développer les États à partir de la base. Et lorsqu'on regarde les agendas internationaux, que ce soit l'agenda des Nations Unies 2030 euh, pour l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable, que ce soit l'agenda euh, urbain de 2016, que ce soit l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine, un accent particulier, effectivement, est mis sur la, la, la décentralisation, parce qu'en fait, les gouvernements locaux sont les piliers de tout développement de territoire. Et on a une charte, et j'aime bien rappeler les instruments africains, parce que souvent on revient aux agendas internationaux, aux textes juridiques internationaux, mais il y a une charte africaine des valeurs, des principes de la décentralisation, de la gouvernance locale et du développement local. Et cette charte-là met un accent particulier sur l'égalité homme-femme pour parvenir à un développement local inclusif qui va bénéficier à tous et qui ne laissera personne euh, sur le côté. Alors, la mise en œuvre euh, performante de la décentralisation doit contribuer à l'atteinte de tous les objectifs de développement que nous avons euh, et évoquer et surtout, et surtout à la transformation des collectivités territoriales décentralisées en terre d'opportunités, de création des richesses. Et c'est pour cela qu'on doit mettre un accent fort sur l'action économique des collectivités à côté de l'action sociale. Parce qu'en en fait, dans les choix de développement de tout État, les collectivités territoriales décentralisées sont les pieds on va avoir une transformation économique au niveau national si on a eu une transformation économique au niveau local. Et on va avoir une véritable transformation économique qui soit inclusive au niveau national si cette transformation économique est inclusive au niveau euh, local. Et cela, au niveau du Cameroun, c'est clairement inscrit dans la stratégie nationale de développement 
euh, de notre pays à l'horizon 2030 et euh, qui vise à faire du Cameroun un nouveau pays industrialisé, avec une attention particulière sur la, la décentralisation. Alors, quand on a cette ambition, comment nous assurer que l'économie féministe va apporter sa contribution dans la transformation des territoires pour que ça devienne des terres d'attractivité, pour que ça devienne des terres qui créent, des terroirs qui créent des, des richesses. On a eu euh, des clarifications conceptuelles sur l'économie féministe, je n'y reviens pas. Par contre, je voulais quand même rappeler rapidement ce qu'on entend par développement local, qui est la mobilisation de l'ensemble des ressources humaines, économiques, socioculturelles, politiques et naturelles locales, nationales et globales, pour l'amélioration et la transformation des conditions de vie des communautés à la base. Donc, les interventions d'appui au développement local se fondent sur une gestion concertée. Gestion concertée des territoires par ses habitants, tous ses habitants, en intégrant plus en amont les besoins et attentes spécifiques et en valorisant les projets et les initiatives. On voit où est la place des femmes. Et plus rapidement, en termes de développement économique local, on voit donc la mobilisation de toutes ces ressources endogènes, les connaissances, les compétences locales, pour attirer des investissements euh, afin de générer euh, des activités économiques inclusives, afin de générer la croissance. La question qui se pose, c'est comment on, on perçoit le rôle des femmes pour que on mette en avant on valorise leurs connaissances, pour qu'on valorise leurs compétences, pour qu'on valorise le travail qu'elles font et qu'on reconnaisse ce travail-là, pour qu'on ait des territoires attractifs. Mais cela n'est pas aisé, parce qu'il y a un ensemble de questions, de défis qui doivent se poser. La problématique de l'égalité homme-femme n'est pas toujours une problématique connue au niveau local. Et d'ailleurs, on considère que c'est une question urbaine, c'est une question des féministes, comme on dirait dans la capitale. Nous, on a des problèmes plus importants ici. Pourquoi vous nous posez cette question-là Est-ce que c'est inscrit dans les outils de planification Vous parliez tout à l'heure de la planification, de budgétisation, de suivi, évaluation. Là aussi, il n'y a pas un travail diagnostique qui soit fait. Et le problème qui se pose encore, c'est que les femmes elles-mêmes ne prennent pas toute la dimension de leur apport dans le développement des territoires. En fait, le rôle qu'elles jouent en tant qu'acteurs de l'économie féministe. Il y a ces problèmes de perception qui perdurent, les problèmes de manque d'accès aux fonciers, de manque d'accès aux mécanismes de financement, c'est ça, c'était fait euh, évoqué tout à l'heure, la question de la représentativité des femmes dans les différents niveaux de décision et le manque d'outils, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure. Alors, pour conclure, parce qu'il ne me reste plus beaucoup de temps, c'est d'indiquer que lorsque nous évoquons les questions d'économie, euh, féministe, on est dans un niveau macro, il est important de se rappeler que cela passe par la base. Et cela passe par la base, ça sous-entend que ceux qui font les politiques en termes de statistiques, qu'on ait des statistiques désagrégées, c'est souvent une problématique au niveau national, mais que cela soit intégré au niveau euh, 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 local. Qu'on ait des outils qui intègrent le genre dans tous les documents de planification, que ce soit les plans communaux de développement, les plans régionaux de développement, qu'on ait des outils sur la budgétisation sensible aux gens, sur l'analyse des projets. Est-ce que ces projets bénéficient aux femmes et aux hommes euh, sur tout ce qui concerne les indicateurs et surtout tout ce qui concerne la valorisation du travail abattu par les femmes, elles qui sont agri agricultrices, elles qui malheureusement sont dans le secteur informel au niveau local, qui n'est pas connu, qui n'est pas toujours valorisé et qui fait qu'on ait une économie locale aveugle. Cette économie locale doit désormais avoir toute sa visibilité. Je vous remercie. Well, thank you so much, Lydi, for taking us to where we need to think about feminist economics the most um, at the household level, at the family level, at the community level. And now our final panelist is Mayada from Sudan who is going to give us her perspective as well.
Um, thank you for the introduction. And um, again, I want to say I'm really, really happy to be at this, um, my first Kadesria event. Um, and I'm going to start um, just by saying a quick thing that today is the day 55 of the war in Sudan, um, which has really devastated um, the, the country, devastated the capital city, created a humanitarian crisis in, in all sense of the, world, of the word. And I want to, I'm saying this because I, I want to urge this um, community of scholars, of, of African scolars, of African feminists to um, have a clear voice in rejecting this war and in finding ways of advocacy, of peaceful protest to amplify the voices of the Sudanese people and to figure out how we can bring an end to this senseless war. Thank you. So moving on to uh, feminist economics and feminist insurrection. And when I, when I was sent the title, I, was, uh, I wasn't sure because it's such a big thing. What, what, what do I do with this really in 20 minutes also? So I've decided to kind of split up the talk into two kind of main pillars or main points. Um, and the first is to kind of talk briefly about the economics discipline and the, uh, the ways in which it is detrimental to, femini to feminism and feminist research and, um, and women, of course. Um, and when I say the economics discipline, I, uh, that in itself very big and, and, and as was mentioned in the keynote earlier, there's different schools and different stances that you can very vocally uh, place yourself in. I'm, I'm talking about sort of the mainstream variant, the sort of neoclassical economics, which largely informs policy, which is considered even from an academic intellectual perspective superior. Uh, it's where the smart people are. You know, everybody who's doing heterodox economics is, is kind of sketchy or wishy-washy and maybe couldn't make it to Harvard and that's why they're doing heterodox economics. So. Um, so yeah, so this is essentially this, this, uh, this um, discipline of, of, of neoclassical economics and what its implications for feminist economics and fem feminist research are. And the, the first thing that, um, that comes to mind is this kind of notion of homo economicus or this sort of economic agent or economic man. And this, is, this, um, this agent is essentially one of the grounding pillars of a lot of the assumptions that the economics, that neo, new classical economics is based on. And this agent is essentially male, uh, to start off with, and you know, he is driven only by his personal interest, and he is um, eerily rational all the time, and he has all of the information, and perhaps antisocial, essentially. And, and w when we think about, th this is the person that all, you know, all the, the, the policy and the theory is based on the assumption that this is how humans are, that they, that they behave and that they, their interests are shaped. And obviously, you know, as women especially, we know that this is definitely not the case because then categories of care work, of, of community building, the roles that women have historically played, the, 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 the notions like Ubuntu that has, me, that has been mentioned several times since yesterday, notions like Nafid, which, based, which are based on the antithesis of this individual, you know, interest-seeking robot. Um, the second implication of sort of the, the fact that neo, neoclassical economics is so bear, overbearing in the discipline is the superiority and sort of innateness of the market. Um, and when I say the market, I don't mean exchange. I don't mean just, you know, the action of exchanging goods and services for, for money. I mean the, the, the infiltration of the logic of commercialization into all forms of, of public and private space. And also the idea that there's no other way, there's no other alternative, there's no other way to organize our economies except if it's around these ideas of commercialization and of, of free markets. And this is um, very detrimental for feminist research and feminist economics because it, it really hampers our imagination of what a feminist transformation of the economy can even look like. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I know a lot of economists and a lot of feminists also, even if they aren't economists, shy away from speaking about the economy. Because it feels like, well, 
this is kind of set in stone. These, these are laws of physics, the laws of supply and demand, the laws of interest rate and inflation and the macroeconomy. These are laws that are unchanging. And they're not. These, these, are, are, these are, 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 you know, the ways that our life has been organized and they are very much sub subject to change. <coughs> Excuse me. The third implication is obviously the productive versus um, reproductive dichotomy, which has been mentioned um, yesterday, I think, in Dr. Sylvia's talk about how it was imposed on the African continent through colonialism and how you know, under this obviously falls the neglect of, of care work, of, of all of the, the labor that is done by women. Um, and, and I think the COVID-19 COVID pandemic has kind of brought it, this to the surface and showed us just how big this load is and who really bears the cost of this. Um, and these, you know, these are issues that are very much ignored in, 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 in the way that economics is taught in the majority of, of higher education in the, around the world and, and um, unfortunately also in the continent. Um, another important implication of, of the dominance of, of, of mainstream economics is, and this is a, a very related to policies, the endurance of austerity politics, uh, the endurance of structural adjustment, which since the 1990s have, you know, the, they're the front line of defense essentially for reform. Like you said, Professor, whenever we think about reform, we think structural adjustment, we think macroeconomic stabilization, we think dealing with budgetary crises. And, 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 and what, you know, despite there being extensive research to show that not only do these policies not help African economies grow, even even if that is our bare minimum, they don't help them grow. But it has been shown that their impact on women in increasing their economic vulnerability, social vulnerability, political vulnerability is vast. And they have made a massive comeback in the global north, like was mentioned yesterday. And definitely, of course, um, on the co continent, especially after the, the economic crisis triggered by COVID. Um, so this brings me to kind of the second part that I wanted to talk about. Um, and in, in what role can feminist economics, um, and I guess this is the feminist in insurrection bit, what role can feminist economics play in change, in democratization in Africa, in fa fighting uh, patriarchal systems, in, um, in pushing back against neoliberal backlash, and I'm, I'm going to kind of use the example of Sudan here because it's what I know most essentially, but I think this could be relevant to a lot, uh, to many of the countries on the continent. So if we think about, you know, kind of working our way backwards from the war now to when the sort of revolution started in 2018, um, and I ask myself the question of what would post-revolution Sudan look like if a feminist agenda was truly incorporated into the post-revolution agenda and women were meaningfully included in the political process beyond the politics of, of representation, of we, we want a quota system or we want more women in parliament or, um, and, and, and what that means for where the country is now essentially at war and in, in a very, very, very difficult position. So obviously the current war is rooted in, in many, many things, and one of them is definitely toxic masculinity, big man politics. Um, I think two days after the war, there was um, a, a phone interview with Himeti, who is the leader of the Rapid Support Forces, the militia, the paramilitary that is fighting the, the armed forces. And he, you know, he was saying, and I'm translating, that you know, he, he fired first. Of, of course, I'm, I'm a man. Of course, I'm not going to. I'm going to respond. And when you hear a statement like that, and you're, and I was in, I was in Khartoum at the time, I hadn't left, and I was thinking to myself, we've been trapped in a, in a room since morning. We have no electricity, no water, and this is his argument. <laughs> so, I mean, if he had said something else, if he had said, oh, he stole my money or something, but this is what he said, and so, and 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 this is very angering because because this makes me think about what it, how. How the way that politics is organized around these kinds of values and these kinds of 
you know, ideas of, of, of how you're supposed to protect your, you know, your, or display even your, your manhood. Um, another reason, obviously, and, and this is kind of a broader issue and, and very relevant to, uh, to the role that feminist economics can, can play, is how, you know, this, this war is obviously one of the manifestations of the failure of state building in post-colonial Sudan. Building an, a, a coherent state that isn't uh, based on patterns of uneven development, uh, patterns of forms of exploitation and value extraction that are driven by the demands of Western capital and are driven by uh, you know, the kind of circuits of the global economy. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the major financiers of, of the, this militia has been the country's gold over the past, pushing on 10 years almost. And um, v Wagner, which is a Russian mercenary group, has military bases around the mining camps. And the mining camps, obviously, the, the mining is being done by Sudanese labor. Sudanese women have increasingly had, a, had a, uh, an increasing role in the past few years, obviously because of the neglect of agriculture and, and the forms of subsistence that they have been dependent on. So they're in these lines and, and they're being guarded by these Russian troops that are holding guns, waiting for them to extract the gold. They put it on the planes and they fly it to wherever they fly it to. Um, and so when we, when we look at these interconnections and when we um, look at where the country has ended up and where it was you know, four years ago when there was mass grassroots mobilization requesting or demanding really uh, democracy, demanding an end to the 30-year dictatorship that has uh, preceded this transitional period, demanding public provisioning essentially, demanding health care and better infrastructure and better schools. Um, and, and, and demanding, even if not very explicitly said, but articulated through the slogans and the chants and the poems that were coming up, and end to the, the racial disparities that exist in a country that has this um, sort of Arab-African divide within it, and that, is, that has been imposed very largely by, by colonial powers and the ways in which they chose certain areas to develop and the ways in which they chose certain areas to build roads in and certain routes for trade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and this kind of leads me to think of what, what if, when these protests happened and when the, the, the Bashir regime fell and the negotiations began, women and, and a, a true feminist you know, feminist agenda, feminist economic agenda, was part of the negotiations that led to the transitional government, which then broke down. And these women were not allowed into these rooms because they, from the perspective, obviously, of the men, they did not prove their worth. They did not prove that they deserved to be in this room. Something, of course, which they, which is, it's unclear what they have to prove and what these men have proven to make themselves in these rooms. They haven't, you know, what, what, who's, who's holding the key and who's ticking, who's making these assessments. But obviously, and everybody in this room knows that what we have to do to kind of prove our intellectual worth or, or political savviness or whatever is, is based on, on these patriarchal norms. And, and I look, you know, I, and, and I look now and I think, well, these, you know, the, even the civilian authorities, the civilian politicians have failed really miserably, and they've had you know, these four years to create a at least some kind of settlement that wouldn't lend itself to this breakdown of violence. Um, even though they had this grassroots mobilization behind them very, very clearly. So uh, where was the feminist econ economics agenda during all of this? It, it, was, it was scattered, it, wasn't, it was there in essence. It was, there, was a, there was a lot of protests that were, that were organized uniquely just by women and they were reading out their manifestos and the manifestos had clear demands about the importance of centering care work, about the importance of, public, of improving public provisioning and expanding the role of the state and providing um, healthcare, education, social protection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
clear demands around re reframing laws um, uh, that pertain to protection of women from sexual violence, from de domestic violence. Um, but but these, th there was backlash against these kind of protests and against these kind of demands, even from within the so-called revolutionary movement, which was still rooted in, 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 in a lot of patriarchal norms. And the problem from, from, from you know, just observing this was that um, despite that, that presence, that important presence, the you know you know feminist economics or ec economists and economics were not centered in in the way that they should be and international organizations and you know this was mentioned in dr sheila's about how what the what you and women say about and what the you know uh, the world economic forum say about and what they think are the priorities of women's betterment are and they avoid talking about the economy and this was also uh, mentioned in in Dr. Lidis but they they when you want to talk about care work when you want to talk about um, macroeconomic policy not from an austerity perspective then you don't really have a place in the room and so what eventually happened despite this grassroots mobilization around unpaired care work etc cetera, etc cetera, is when the women's agenda post revolution was being framed driven of course by the you know, international donor system. It was about uh, quota systems and political participation. And not political participation in service of a feminist agenda, which is great, but just political participation to be in the room. And, you know, I, um, you know, I, th I think about something that I think Dr. Pearl mentioned just about modernizing inequality. And I think this very much is what was being done, essentially. And when I think about what the implications of all of this are for Cadestri and for this institute and for you know, strategizing and moving forward, and I think that feminist econom economics then needs to be more present within gender work, more, more prioritized. There needs to be more research projects commissioned more around these themes, more dialogue um, between feminists and feminist economists, um, and, and more direct dealing with development policy no longer sort of shying away and kind of talking about women in the social sphere on only, but talking about them in microeconomics and in macroeconomics, and not seceding place to these, you know, the, this big boys club to define what macroeconomics is. It's not only percentages of inflation and interest rates and B GDP budget deficits. This isn't only it. These, this cannot be the end, essentially, game. Um, and also calling on feminists themselves to kind of not shy away from, from these topics. And I know that that's difficult because the way that the economics discipline is framed is framed to be very intimidating for women, generally, and especially for women who, who don't ascribe to the mainstream um, ideas of neoclassical economics or of, of capitalism, essentially, and and you know if we if we don't do this, then essentially we will be just modernizing inequality. Women will remain to be poor and will remain to be underpaid, and and their work will remain to be overlooked. Thank you. I'm going to open up the conversation for your thoughts, your comments, not necessarily even. Um, restricted to what our panelists have shared. Anything that you'd like to add to the room is all welcome. Just like to appreciate the brilliant uh, presentations that have been made by the panelists. And I just wanted to contribute by giving like two or three case studies touching on what every panelist spoke about. Sheila asked a question about uh, her first question. Um, can a collective of feminists cause system change? And I just want to give a case study of what Kenya Land Alliance tried to do and we fell flat on our faces and we are re-strategizing. The issue of the FTAs, um, when we analyze those FTAs, especially between Kenya and the US and Kenya and the UK, we noticed that 60% of the FTAs would affect women, small-scale farmer in agriculture. 
uh, foreign trade agreements. <laughs> Sorry, let me avoid acronyms. As a practitioner, at times I forget about that. Yes, so what we did is to analyze the foreign trade agreements and just point out that women would be more affected. And their limitation in knowledge then limits the engagement that they can um, compete with a farmer in the States and they're in Kenya. And then this is a free trade area that they're supposed to engage in. And our objections were not really hard. Um, we went to court and uh, the... the, the <laughs> The case is still in court, but I don't see uh, us getting any positive response from that. Considering that the US and the UK would be given 25-year tax rivets, and the farmers have to compete, um, it's something that we need to think further. I don't know um, how we can confront that, because for me, from where I sit as a director at Kenya Land Alliance, that's a transnational crime, actually against the women in Kenya. And then um, just to comment on what the second speaker lady spoke about, um, last year we also did a study around commodification of land. How it's always touted that when a woman has a resource like land, then she's a rich woman. And we wanted to understand um, if land is commodified in taking, um, using it as a collateral in a um, financial institu institution and, and, and trying to set up a small or medium-sized enterprise, um, what percentage of women are using, are commodifying land and using it as um, collateral? And we involve microfinance institutions and banks and um, the coalition that brings together private sector, KEPSA. And once KEPSA had an idea where we were going, because we wanted to prove that we don't have data on that, just a general sentence that we normally say, a woman with a resource like land is rich, but we wanted to know how many commodify land and are actually wealthy. KEPSA frustrated us. So in terms of a system change and just ensuring that um, we have policies that actually consider um, these blank statements that we do. Let them, let's give women land for them to be rich. Um, those are some of the statements that last year we were frustrated about. We went further to just find out of the vote heads that ministries have in Kenya, um, of the vote heads, how much went to women in terms of resource rights. And we found that out that in land and resettlement, when you're talking about policies, a very, very, a very small percentage uh, could be attributed to, to women uh, being empowered by the vote heads in ministries. And lastly, I'm just giving an experience of Kenya. These, all these studies we attempted to do in 2022 uh, the last one is in terms of what Mayada was talking about, value extraction and uh, women in the resource rights um, sector. Um, when we talk about concessions and awards and uh, community-led conservation efforts, when you're talking about value extraction, at Kenya Land Alliance, um, we work on precious stones, um, the con conservation uh, conversation and it's very sad because women rarely benefit and there is a very thin line between privacy of contracts and the right of public education or public participation or public information. So that gives rise to the violence that Awino was talking about in the morning in terms of um, it doesn't have to be physical. At times, the women in, in, who receive the short end of the stick are subjected to violence because of who they are, because they cannot understand the discourse. So they are subjected to various forms of violence in their bid to be part of the development that is going on in their society. Those are comments. They are not questions. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Um, May we recognize that we all want to speak in the space and keep our interventions a bit shorter. Yes, Paul. Taking over the other disciplines 
that perform what um, Prof. Ahikira said is um, patriarchal, um, patriarchal authoritarianism. MNE systems, and that, you know, so they perform their work in terms of whether you are economically correct and you are following finance principles that are decent. Um, HR principles um, have a way of requiring certain notions of what it is that you've done in line with the prerogatives of economics. But more importantly, economics and other disciplines that pride themselves of vigilance have an issue of of being of speaking to other disciplines but not being spoken to. They, they frame the discourse such that what are you going to do for us to move from this point to that point in terms of growth, regardless of who we're tramping on in the process. And therefore, I think that at some point, we really need to examine the coloniality of our disciplines rigorously and question it in relation to the nature of patriarchal systems that they purport and be able to use the language, their language, especially the economists that, 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 that are on our side, <laughs> to use their language to question this, uh, this, this prerogative to speak but not be spoken to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jean? Jean, then we'll move to Walter, then we'll come back to you. Yes. Thank you. Mine is a question. Uh, Professor Schiller and the rest of the speakers are alluding to more feminist economists in policy, in legislation, to cause transformations that we require. But the neoliberal paradigm of development is so dominant. It's, it's present in all spheres of, of life, or all, do, all domains of power, whether it's the ideological, the systemic, the institutional and interpersonal even what we are taught in school around if you did economics the, the forces of demand and supply that's all we know and we have totally invisibilized alternative forms of economy so how would this increased pool navigate around um, that that systemic takeover of the classical neoliberal view of what it development means Thank you. Um, Walter? Uh, two of uh, the panelists, uh, Professor Banwari and, uh, and Shahida, talk about uh, transition. Uh, the, the World Bank and the IMF uh, for a long time keep telling us that uh, transition, we have to relocate uh, development from the low productivity sectors towards the higher uh, productivity. By that, they mean we need to move economic activity from the rural areas uh, towards more uh, urban industrialization type of uh, development which occurred in the euro huh? in the euro uh, euro euro americas so uh, i was just uh, interested in, in finding out what kind of discussions are ongoing within uh, the feminist uh, feminist economics what kind of transition uh, are we envisaging huh? you, you 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 talk about a more just africa what does that look like huh? in, in, in the realm of feminist uh, Feminist, uh, feminist uh, economics. Thank you. You give up on uh, institutions of higher learning that you left to uh, find another space from where you could uh, make uh, contributions. Uh, but as uh, someone who just uh, spoke said, these uh, neoliberal paradigms, it uh, has infiltrated the entire social fabric so there's no place where you can go and and work in peace and achieve your goals um and also as uh, you see uh, uh, although the research and publications uh, uh, now more and more uh, you do it to meet the requirement of the neoliberal institutions uh, uh, still i wonder if it is necessarily with this uh, either or, you can't do it from within those institutions, therefore you go out. Or what are the possibilities for building bridges 
for um, interacting from any space. And when you leave that space, what kind of continued collaboration, uh, ground for collaboration that you can um, uh, you know, maintain, especially um, when we think of the younger generation, uh, we need to provide <laughs> learning spaces to guarantee this new generation of, uh, of actors who will carry on the struggle. So if you could elaborate a little bit on this, uh, this space, the social space from where we can act and what kind of um, a partnership uh, can be uh, built uh, to achieve our common goals. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Patricia, and then we get back to the panelists. Right-wing conservative paper called the Daily Telegraph recently had an article about that and where to, where to go next. I mean, in the North, they're promoting, what, as far as I can see, a form of fascism <laughs> as a way of addressing some of the economic uh, crisis. Um, but among scholars, and I'm interested in the decolonial work being done around economics, uh, many have been, especially around environmental issues, there's the work by people like Jason Hickel around degrowth. And um, their work by geographers who actually are interested in what they call diverse economies. So it's not, these are alternatives or probably hybrids of sort of market-based um, social enterprise type activities. And I wonder, because we have to move away, the neoliberal paradigm is not working, it might be all inclusive, but are you thinking about alternatives, a way of mobilizing people to think about sort of everyday economic activities in a different framework beyond the neoliberal? I mean, it might be difficult because of our um, political, um, co the context that we operate in, but is any of that thinking, because I think that blue sky thinking is needed by feminist economists and certainly by African feminists. Uh, thank you. Over to you, the panelists. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And let me be certain exceptions, but in many parts, and certainly in my own country, we find that uh, um, every single um, scheme, every single policy is actually only geared towards profit maximization and at the cost of people's livelihoods, at the cost of everything else, you know, of the environment, as you're saying. So is there an alternative? I'm not a degrover. I, I don't embrace Hickel's uh, perspective completely because I do believe that we need growth to be able uh, to distribute. But I'm not a trickle-down economist saying that we need it to grow and then distribute because that, that growth will never get distributed from that particular perspective. So what we are suggesting is that as feminist economists, we need to make the policy makers, and it's a challenge, it's a difficult job, we need to make them understand all the vagaries that are impacting on the care economy, on the environment, on the different perspectives uh, that we are calling development, what is development, and the challenge to make them accept the idea that there is no possibility for us to always say that growth must come first and then distribution and well-being, because that doesn't always happen. And it comes back to the argument that we were making, that growth does not equate development. So uh, I, I think it's a struggle, but the reason why I evoked it is because I think that within Kodisria, the work that is being done, and the example that I took, and this is linked to one of the questions that was asked about those feminist voices, the collective that have been putting a statement together to the envoys that have been appointed by the African Union to try and revisit. But we must not forget that when we are discussing African economies and feminist economics, we cannot dissociate this debate from what is happening within the global system at the marginal position that Africa, despite the decades of development, is still at. And that is our perpetual struggle. So as African femi feminists, I think we can add our voice, but not only a voice, we can actually bring to bear 
the kind of policies that uh, our friend here was talking about, Maida, Maida was talking about, and the kinds of policies that the local government uh, that um, Dr. Lidi was talking about, I think all these combine together. And I think the other main challenge is, and I think Maida evoked it very well, is that uh, the discipline itself, and this is linked to another question that was asked, the discipline itself is, uh, is not sufficiently, it's not, it's not even taking into consideration, especially in, and that is why I propose that we need to do an audit and a study of what's happening in our economics department and in our faculties which are teaching economics or business schools, because it is only one kind of economics, so the neoclassical and mainstream economics. So there is a contradiction. On the one hand, certain people are saying, oh, neoliberalism has failed, and what we continue to teach to our young people is embrace neoliberalism. So that contradiction and those tensions need to be addressed. And it seems to me that a greater pool of feminist scholars, because someone asked the question whether if we have a greater pool of feminist scholars, we can actually all change, change the situation. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not just a question of, num of numbers, as I always argue. But certainly, if we have a well-conversed and versed feminist scholars who understand the intricacies of uh, the articulation between the micro and the macro, the, the, the kinds of um, issues that you were raising on the everyday, and how do we put that in, into perspective, that can perhaps help us to start unpacking the, the rhetoric and the problems with macroeconomic management and macroeconomic policies in the way that it has been conceptualized by mainstream economists and neoclassical economists. I think that's um, what I want to say to this. Um, I think, Dre, your question was linked to that. Uh, did I miss something else, another element of your question that I have not responded to? It's the dimension of, uh, it's as if the, the yes, way you can it, yeah, I remember it is I, either or, yeah. yeah. To the idea of my own personal experience that um, you picked on that. I think different spaces have got different realities. My own space is a small island state and we have many issues, and we've been projected as a model, you know, like Mauritius is a model, a beacon of democracy, a model of development. But the kinds of <coughs> issues and points that were made by faith in terms of disaggregating the gender statistics and what's happening to women as a result of those neo neoliberal paradigms has not been effectively done in a place like Mauritius. And the university itself is, has become a space where, and I have a colleague from the University of Mauritius in the room, Ramola is in the room, she can confirm. The space is not one which is encouraging any kinds of debates or any kind of conversations around these kinds of issues. It's almost like you go and you teach and there's nothing which is really like an intellectual kind of ferment or an intellectual kind of stimulation let alone that there is no intellectual stimulation, but there is no effort towards making that scholarship speak to the everyday reality of people. And that is my own challenge. And I refuse to buy into a scholarship which cannot contribute to making a difference to people's condition. Now, the question that you raise is whether being in the other space then gives satisfaction. No. Certainly not, because it is a permanent challenge. And I think somebody said yesterday that we need to reach a point where we can stop thinking about our own immediate self-interest. Uh, I, think, I think it was Josephine, I can't remember who. But uh, uh, to stop thinking about I mean, our immediate self-interest and to try and see what is the contribution that we can make as scholars and as practitioners to the field, to the actual living condition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I have something to say? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna respond to the question about the, like how do we basically, how do we do it essentially? How do we make a place for ourselves? And 
Um, in, the, um, in March of 2008, the head of the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the US, said that the, straight, the state of the macroeconomy is the best that it's ever been. And in August of 2008, the world economy crashed. <laughs> and this is the top economist, essentially, of the world, by virtue of, of his position, essentially, and his education, and et cetera, et cetera. And so when, obviously, the 2008 crash happened, and uh, it was obvious that nobody, you know, when policymakers were calling on the economists to explain to them what, what was going on, the economists of the top universities of the world, nobody was able to explain what was going on. Um, and, and the response to this was interesting in that the students of the economics discipline in the, in the global north, specifically North America and Western Europe, began demanding a type of it, that, that, they, that they be taught a type of economics that helps them make sense of what's going on around them. Because it became very clear that what they were being taught, like you said, the demand, the supply, the et cetera, et cetera, had, was, was very useless in helping them understand what it is, how it is that the economy is actually operating. <clears throat> and so this, this, you know, this pushback from the students led to actual changes in a lot of departments of economics around, especially in the, in the global north. More teacher, uh, you know, professors who were previously not making the cuts to become professors in these fancy schools were now actually sought after because they had been doing these writings and, and this research kind of on the fringes of the discipline. And there's been a lot of change. There's been a lot of change even in schools that have historically been very mainstream. So the change hasn't been, it's not where we want it to be. But what, what I think this means for us is that the same pushback can lead to, 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 to positive results. The, the pushback in forms of criticism, the pushback in forms of trying to find, like, uh, Dr. Patricia said, trying to find alternative forms of, of economic organization that we can propose um, as trials. Um, and I think also kind of pushing for this, this, this margin of error. I mean, in the, the same way that austerity politi polit policies have, been, have endured for almost 40 years now, despite them proving that they don't work, we should be given a chance to try different things. If we're okay with, with failing for 40 years using one thing, why don't you give us five years of failing using another thing? <laughs> so I think just pushback, just continuous pushback on this um, and mobilizing and organizing and, and on, on, on different levels. Yeah, thank you. Lady. Euh, merci beaucoup. Je vais juste faire un, un petit commentaire sur les, les questions de foncier. C'est d'indiquer que, euh, en général, en, en général, le droit reconnaît euh, l'égalité euh, à l'accès au foncier, mais dans la réalité, euh, les femmes, euh, notamment euh, euh, lorsqu'elles vont en mariage, n'auront pas euh, cet héritage-là. Et ce que nous remarquons également lorsque on parle de la valeur financière du, du foncier qui permet, euh, lorsqu'on a un titre euh, foncier, d'avoir accès à des crédits à la banque. Euh, ce qui se passe malheureusement, c'est que en général, ce sont les femmes qui valorisent euh, le foncier à travers l'agriculture. La, Mais lorsqu'on arrive au moment euh, où on acquiert le titre foncier, ça sera en général au nom de l'homme. Et donc, c'est lui qui pourrait avoir euh, accès au financement. Et le, 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 le deuxième point... Euh, de commentaires, c'est par rapport à, à l'économie euh, féministe pour dire qu'au niveau local, c'est des petites choses. Des petites choses en termes d'indiquer comment les femmes en tant que contributrices à l'économie, c'est elles qui euh, animent euh, tout le volet du secteur informel, il faut valoriser ce secteur informel, le petit commerce, c'est elles qui euh, font la culture des, des champs lorsqu'on va être dans les pays d'Afrique centrale, on vous parlera des revendeuses, toute l'économie, euh, toute la sécurité alimentaire en réalité repose entre leurs mains. Mais c'est elles également euh, qui permettent à la société au niveau local de payer moins lourd euh, la, toute la question sociale avec la prise en charge des enfants, la prise en charge des personnes âgées. Imaginez ce que ça coûterait à l'économie, mais on ne valorise pas euh, cet apport-là. Euh, L'autre point également, euh, pour les petites choses, c'est de dire que c'est elles qui sont les consommatrices des services sociaux à la base qui sont payants. Si on parle de l'eau, si on parle euh, 
euh, de, 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 des places de, lorsqu'on va regarder euh, les taxes sur les marchés. C'est qui qui paye les taxes C'est des revendeuses qui payent les taxes et qui permettent à la commune d'avoir les financements. Donc tout cela n'est pas suffisamment pris en compte pour qu'on rende visible leur contribution euh, à l'économie au niveau local. Et je pense que euh, ça peut et, et être utile lorsqu'on va faire une analyse beaucoup plus macro. Et le dernier point, c'est effectivement leur visibilité, leur représentativité dans les, les, les secteurs de décision. Si cela est plus visible, euh, on aura, de mon point de vue, plus d'impact dans tous les documents de planification, de budgétisation, tout ce qui concerne la, 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 le, le montage des projets pour qu'on ait une durabilité de tout ce qui est fait euh, euh, au niveau local par rapport au développement économique local. Merci. For a job well done, but as well as the rest of us in the room for being attentive, interactive, and asking all those questions that, and comments that were brought into the room. I know that Walter may feel unsatisfied by the answers to his question, what does a just feminist economics look like? That would require another whole panel session. But as um, I'll just say, just really think what the alternatives look like. When you think about the fact that Africa loses more out of illicit financial flows than we actually receive in aid, a just um, future looks like that, where we are able to curb um, the illicit financial flows that we continue to lose to all these multinationals, um, ETC. So interrogating those, having more progressive tax systems that are centering women and ensuring that women are not paying more than those who should be paying, and maybe that's the redistributive um, uh, aspect that Professor Sheila has spoken about. So I know that a lot of times as feminists we are asked for those alternatives as what are your alternatives and we have articulated them or attempted to articulate them in different spaces and in different documentation and we can share that documentation but it's also an ongoing conversation for us to continue being able to help our economists to see that there are actually alternatives to the neoliberal uh, model of development so thank you very much um, Godwin, I hope you are satisfied that I have not, uh, I have tried to meet the time that was allotted to this very important subject. And um, it takes us to the economics of food, which is important. Food security is also important. And a just alternative is also food sovereignty. And I hope that we'll see a bit more of our indigenous foods on the table.